Good evening. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Lake Orion Village Council. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. President Van Portley. Here. President Pro Tem Nard. Here. Council Member Hobbs. Here. Council Member Lamb. Here. Council Member Luxinger. And she stepped out to the bathroom. Council Member Matheson. Here. Council Member Rook. Here. President Van Portley, we have a quorum. Thank you. Okay. Presentations, item number four, we have none. Item five. Call for the public non-agenda items. We'd like to ask that you limit your duration to three minutes. And I'll ask, uh, I've got some cards up here. Do you have any of these, Susan, as well? I, I passed those to you. Okay. I have some cards up here of people that want to speak, uh, non-agenda items. And I've got... One from uh, Ms. Reva Beatty for non-agenda public comment. Hello. Hello. Um, tonight I wanted to talk about the public drawdown. Um, I just, there was a lot of concerns that I had with not having a lot of notice. Um, According to my notes, on September 12th at the Village Hall meeting, it was announced that the drawdown was not going to happen, and this was also stated during several meetings throughout the summer that it was not going to happen, and that it was being pushed off until season of 2023. On September 13th, the next day, on the DDA meeting, it was announced that the drawdown was in fact happening. Uh, this only gave us about 15 days notice to have about 2,500 plus boats off the lake. Uh, and according to my math, it was about 200 boats a day. Now, looking at the lake now, we definitely made it. Um, there was a lot of people that struggled and there were some things that were affected uh, with this. On September 21st, in the Orion Review, it announced that they were delaying, and this was five days before they were saying that it was happening on the 26th, this only gave us five days notice that they were delaying it by three days. Um, at this point, most of the boats were already off the lake. Um, I just found that, and actually on September 28th, I have a ruler outside that I've been taking notes each day with, and it had actually gone up an inch. Um, and also note the Orion Review stated that it would actually fully be down by October 17th. I don't see, judging by my ruler today, I don't see how that's going to happen. And with lining up contractors with such short notice has been nearly impossible. And this is my biggest concern. I have a limestone break wall. I have to make repairs this year. Um, I've reached out to three contractors. I've not heard anything back. Um, it just created a lot of stress and chaos, especially for the, the people doing haulers, uh, or the people actually doing the hauling on this lake. Most of the lake, is full of pontoons and they don't have trailers. So they have to contact a hauler. Um, so the majority of these people are using the same four to five people. Um, and it affects my tour business as well. I had 48 people that I had to reschedule um, for the month of October. This affected my business as well. I had a lot of people that were, some were um, very frustrated and this put me in a bad place with my customers. Um, just a thought moving forward, if you guys are redoing the website uh, for the village, um, maybe think about saving on postage for the water bills and having a place where customer or all the residents could log in and pay their water bill online and make that a special place for announcements just to save on postage. Um, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And I have... I think this is probably a non-agenda item as well. Um, 
Anybody else for non-agenda item? Good Hi, evening. good evening. I'm so glad I could be here today. Ms. Mosier, do you have um, a letter that you want to read? Yes, I do. Could I, could I um, interject a moment? Yes. <clears throat> we all, this board, received that letter, mm -hmm. correct? And I read it as well, and we all read it. The last three paragraphs are a solicitation for a candidacy of your village council position. And if I could, council, do you have a, something you might be able to share with us on that? Sure. Um, village facilities or equipment may not be used as a means of producing or disseminating to the community any materials that advertise or promote a political party or the candidacy of an individual for public office as that would be contrary to the Michigan Campaign Finance Act. Uh, thus, any, any statements by not only council but members of the public uh, in village council chambers promoting the candidacy of a person for a public office is prohibited. So any comments to that for anybody, whether the public or council as a whole, should be avoided at all costs so this council does not violate the CFA. So my apologies, but that question was raised. That was new information just received. I just wanted to share with you if you might abide by that. So that's the budget and water usage information. Well, the budget and water usage information is being discussed at council level. You're welcome to repeat that. I believe... Um, what is it you want me to... I, I'm not understanding. Mr. Mr. President, if I may. I have read the letter. It appears that the last three paragraphs probably would be in violation of the CFA, so um, that would not be appropriate for... Uh, public comment using village facilities. But the rest of it is, so does you, not contain language promoting a candidate. So you don't want me to comment on the increase in the water and the sewage and the amount it would cost per residence? No, that's perfectly acceptable. Three, so what are three, the last three, three paragraphs? Three. I'm confused. The last three paragraphs. You said the last three paragraphs. So. The first, uh, if I'm looking at this, the first. If we start it, I'm sorry to interrupt if we That's may. That's fine. If, 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 the, the paragraph starting with if I and everything below that. Well, it's saying I'm going to request. It's my request. So why is that not permissible? It was just explained, to my understanding, by the council about the appeal of the candidacy and what you would do. I don't mind the other information, I, and, I'm, and I'm apologetic, but um, you're welcome to read the other information that we're already working on that you're explaining as well, if you'd like. Okay, so I can't talk about my family? That's in the last three suggests, paragraphs. That suggests the last three paragraphs. Well, I would like to talk about my family and what we're paying. That's part of the last three paragraphs. So if you want me to, to not talk about if I'm elected um, and not talk about that, I won't talk about it. But I do have a right to say what well, we're paying and how it is, is affecting us. Well, I, I like to keep this as just public comment right now and not entertain it as a debate. I'm not, deba I'm not debating it. If you would like to bring it back as to the legalities of what you can and can't say, that could be another time. Well, I'm going to read the letter. And thank <clears throat> And you. we would like to ask that in violation of the MC, I believe it's A, sir? Yeah, Michigan Campaign Finance Act? Yeah, that you Well, that can come out. I won't say anything about that. The last three paragraphs, that's all. Well, the last second, the second to the last paragraph is talking about me, if you look at it. Mm -hmm. So I can say anything I want to about my family. Have at it. Let's go. Okay. Okay. So our interim village manager 
Wayne O'Neill and our new village engineer, Carol, Carol Thurber, PE, have done something that the village council and past village managers have not been able to do for years. They have addressed the single most pressing infrastructure issue in our village and provided an immediate and agreeable solution to all parties except the taxpayers. They have found funding and have prepared an action plan. I seriously applaud them for their efforts on our behalf. They have done three in three months what has been put off for seven years. I recommend that the village council keep these valuable assets to our village. The village council is selecting a new village manager, as we know, tonight, and I understand they're considering bringing back one of their previous hires. Unfortunately, we now have to pay for a new sewer system costing approximately $7 million, and we all will have to share in paying these costs. At this time, I can only estimate what amount we will pay, pay through increased sewer and water fees. Estimate, bond, estimate of bond cost and payment. $7 million borrowed for 20 years at 5% interest has an approximate yearly payment of $554,000. Three different ways to look at the uh, uh, pro, I'm sorry, uh, approximate extra cost on our water bills. Increase per person, $554,000 divided by 3,000 residents equals $184 per person per year. Increase per parcel, $554,000 divided by 1225 tax parcels equals $450 per parcel per year. Increased cost per unit, $554,000 divided by $111,000 for 144 units per year equals $4.97 per unit. My, water, my 2021 water sewer bill totaled $14.2339 for 75 units. My future approximate additional cost will be $372.75 per year. That's a 26 percent 26, uh, increase. If I, okay, I'm not supposed to read this one? That would be the, where the council had suggested that it would be inappropriate. <clears throat> And we have, okay. and, and I apologize because. Um, I would have appreciated some sort of a response today before I came up here. I, I'm sorry. It was distributed at four o'clock, I think you sent that today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just found out about this myself. Okay. I don't even have the letter in front of me, quite honestly. Okay. Oh, that's the three. Well, I'm going to finish. My family, sorry, but I'm going to finish. Um, my family had to save for our house, our children, and our future. It is time that the village saves money for our future. The election is um, November 8th, and there is a typo, and I apologize. It's time for a change. Please vote for That's the future where you're not of our village. Allow that portion there. That's the violation of the Michigan Campaign Finance Act. Correct, Council? It's possible. That one's more to mind, but that's why it's suggested that at all costs, anybody avoid political comments that might um, okay might okay so thank support you. a candidate. Thank you for working with us. Thank I do you. have one other comment. Um, so, yeah. Mr. President, since you asked if um, Councilman Michael Lamb and I are married, we are. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I wasn't sure. That's why I had to ask. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, we'll close the uh, call to the public. I've got other cards mm. here, but they're on the agenda items, and we'll look to have some input at that time. Moving on to the consent agenda, we have four items this evening. One of them is the engineer's report for the Village of Lake Orion financial commitments regarding critical infrastructure, which I'd like to pull and just read to the public as part of um, everybody knowing what's going on in our community. Item two, McKenna planning and zoning monthly report. Item three, approval of Village Council regular meeting minutes for September 26th. And number four, approval of Village Council special meeting minutes for September 30th. So I'd entertain a motion for the three, and then I will read the uh, 
Village of Lake Warren financial commitments critical regarding critical infrastructure. So moved. Support. All those in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. So we got a very good letter from our engineers, our new engineers, um, Nowak, Frouts, and I'd like to read this to you. It's a good um, heads up on some of the uh, needs in our community and the need to work together as a team going forward in a many, many different ways. Honorable. Honorable Council Members, this is just the Village of Lake Orion Financial Commitments Critical Infrastructure. As you are aware, the Oakland County Water Resource Commission maintains the Village of Lake Orion's sanitary sewer system. The original operating agreement with the Water Resource Commission, WRC, was signed in 1972 and an updated agreement was signed in 2019. As part of their services, the Water Resource Commission provides a report annually regarding the status of the sanitary sewer system. The WRC also obtained a stormwater asset management and wastewater saw grant in 2015 to assess the sanitary sewer system, document assets, review revenue structure, and create a capital improvement plan. The final report was completed in November of 2018. In that report, it was reported that the sanitary pump stations were aging and in need of repair. The pumps are no longer manufactured and repairs are difficult considering the pumps are no longer available. It was determined that they must be replaced. Additionally, there are some improvements necessary to the highest priority sanitary sewer gravity mains. The WRC presented the overall plan and needs to the Village Council in 2018 and again in July of 2021. The approximate cost of these improvements is $7 million. At this time, the improvements are not only necessary but become crucial. The WRC has indicated that they may terminate their maintenance contract and no longer provide the maintenance to the Village's sewer system if these repairs and updates are not completed. Our office, along with the interim manager, DPW Director Wes Sanchez and Village Attorney Mary Kucherik have met with WRC's legal and engineering team and have developed a plan of action that is satisfactory to both parties. The Village of Lake Orion will be applying for a clean water state revolving fund loan in the coming months. This loan is also the same funding as the Village of Lake Orion obtained for the phase one and two water system improvements. Fortunately, with the current infrastructure funding, there may be principal forgiveness on a loan of at least 10% of the loan. We expect that the improvements will begin in the first quarter of 2024 with a loan closing in the end of 2023. We will submit an intent to apply prior to November, November 1 of 2023. Our intent with this correspondence is for the Council to be aware of the financial obligations with these now required improvements. The Village has already incurred a $6 million revolving fund loan from the water system improvements completed in 2019 and must now also commit to an additional $7 million in loans. These expect expenditures are necessary for the critical infrastructure of the village. It should also, also be noted that the village had also intended to complete the phase three and four water main improvements through the revolving loan program, approximately $6.5 million. However, these projects have been put on hold temporarily in order to address the critical sanitary sewer improvements. We recommend that the village manager and financial team review the village's financial commitments and advise the council regarding financial commitments, both present and future. So that's the letter from our engineers. It's what we have been discussing here and there. We're looking for solutions for our pump stations and additional infrastructure improvement. These also are some of the discussions that are happening on a broader scale with such as our DDA and their efforts, our two committees, joint DDA and, and uh, village council that are looking for support that they can share in this as well. So more to come, but I wanted to share that letter. And uh, since that was brought down, uh, Mr. President, I'll make a motion to receive and file the Noah and Frost letter dated October 6, 2022, 
regarding financial commitments regarding critical infrastructure. Support. All those in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on to approval of the agenda. There's no new items other than what's listed. I'll look for a motion to approve. I'm sorry, you have your raised hand. Excuse me, I'm just <laughs> requesting that um, I'm hearing from some people back here that they're having trouble hearing, so if you please be sure tonight when you speak, all of you can speak into your mic so that everyone can hear what is being said. Thank, Thank you. you. Move to approve the agenda. Support. All those in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right, public hearings. Public hearing and consideration of commercial rehabilitation exemption certificate number two for West Village, 55 West Elizabeth Street, pursuant to Michigan Public Act 210 of 2005. Mr. O'Neill, is there anything you'd like to start with this, or should we just have the presenters step well, forward? I have the village attorney, and there's somebody from the audience, of the, from West Village. Okay. So, um, <coughs> who'd like to start first? I will, Mr. President, if yes, you sir. want. In your packet included is a comprehensive letter from me indicating the uh, criteria that this uh, council would review and what, determining whether or not to grant or deny the request. Um, just with regard to uh, the first A through D criteria re regarding um, the qualified local government unit, commercial rehab district, commercial property and rehab, uh, those first four criteria you really already uh, observed and determined because those were the criteria for establishing the district that this council heard some time ago. So really starting on page two, you have the criteria uh, that the statute requires to consider uh, whether or not to grant it. I will indicate that uh, we did provide proposed resolutions both to deny and to grant. Both of those resolutions would need to be appropriately revised based on whatever findings this council might decide after tonight's hearing, public hearing and deliberation on the matter. So those are, and, and there should be red, <laughs> red areas in those proposed resolutions where we would have to fill in the blanks or choose from certain options in those resolutions. So. Uh, just keep that in mind, and uh, hopefully we laid out the criteria that you would uh, consider in either granting or denying the request. Uh, and I'll leave it to the applicant to uh, explain to you how they believe uh, they meet all the requirements. Thank you. Quest Development, gentlemen. Good evening, everyone, members of council, council president, uh, certainly staff, and members of the public. Um, Matthew Gibb, 930 Lakewood in Orion Township, for the record, for your good clerk. Uh, this council has been well aware of the project for some time. Uh, Ms. Rudd's smiling. She's like, please don't go through it again. Uh, the project, just in quick synopsis, uh, is on track. Uh, it involves a historic preservation uh, watching the uh, dialogue in the community in recent months. I know that that is an important topic for some. For us, it's a certainty, meaning we're going to preserve the building and do the restoration of the building, but we're going to put 29 apartment units uh, loft style within the building and build the rest. We're staying within the ordinance that has been prescribed at prior meetings, and limiting this project to 89 units, which is the maximum that's allowed um, under the ordinance. We didn't seek variance from that. We didn't seek an extension or increase of the unit count. Uh, and so the project is, as has been described um, many, many times to this council. Tonight we're here following the public hearing to create the district. Uh, this council did find that there was criteria that would be purposeful to create a district to allow the application for an exemption certificate. What that means for the tax paying community, myself included, is that we're seeking an abatement of the taxes that would be charged that would be in addition to those that are currently and presently paid. The way a two, public act 210 abatement works, or an exemption certificate as it's called under the law, is that we're currently 
the property currently has a value. And when this practice is completed, it will have a value and the taxes that are increased as a result of that reassessment assessment are what are abated. We're asking that the abatement be for 10 years and is allowed under the statute. And the reason for that is we are making progress, but the project continues to be very tenuous from a financial standpoint. While the developer is putting in a substantial amount of their own equity into the project, they've already put in uh, well in excess of a million dollars just in this preparatory work uh, for the project itself. Um, interest rates have gone from under 3% to over 7% in the time that it's taken us to get to this stage. I know that's not your problem. It's not the public's problem, but it certainly creates a hardship uh, ongoing, and so we're hopeful that this council tonight would uh, consider the exemption certificate for approval. We've said many times that the state of Michigan is seeking to participate in this historic preservation for the village. Uh, they are. They have tentatively approved uh, an additional contribution from the Michigan Strategic Fund through the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. As we've said many times, those awards are contingent uh, by their rules and by the laws in the state of Michigan and the MEDC. Uh, it requires a local contribution. So what would that be? We've said many times that we would seek what would be the minimum contribution that we could see that would allow us to do the historic preservation and move forward. It's not the lengthy um, pilot program that a low-income housing project would be. It's not the obsolete property rehabilitation act that would be an onerous burden. We're not seeking a transformational brownfield, which would take everyone's taxes, including the schools and the library. We're asking for a commercial rehabilitation uh, certificate that would be 10 years and again abating only those um, taxes, not schools um, uh, and, not, and, and not, not, um, not the school taxes. So that being said, the criteria, I wasn't privy to your good counsel's letter. I have significant respect for him, so I kind of have a sense of what he did and laid out. Not being privy to it, I think the key element is the eligibility for the certificate itself. We've said many times in the past that that really renders an analysis as to the building being previously used in some commercial fashion. Commercial fashion as we set forth in our application, which you've had now three or four different occasions from your prior manager to this one, um, is broadly construed. Uh, in this project, and even speaking to members of the public today, I was reminded that the Boys and Girls Club held operations there. We've had uses in that building that include psychiatrists and other nonprofit organizations. The broadness of the scope of the use of the building from being a scope to those ancillary uses certainly render it different than a purely residential use or others that might not be eligible um, under this particular statute. So we believe that this is very eligible. Quite frankly, given everything that's been stacked up, uh, it has been asserted to this council many times by myself, Mr. Westberg's here as well, if there's specific questions of the developer following the public hearing. Um, uh, this project has been very carefully put together with the assistance of not only this village, uh, but with the National Trust for Historic Preservation and its rules, with the representatives of the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, the Community Revitalization, Revitalization Program. Um, uh, we're very, very close. Uh, this is the last element of putting together all of those efforts uh, to move forward, and we're hopeful that you'll consider that uh, uh, the full abatement. With that, I'll be quiet. You've heard all this before. Uh, we're here following the public hearing either then or at the time of consideration to answer any more questions. So, Mr. Gibb, this is noted as commercial rehabilitation exemption certificate number two. Correct? That's the way your council has put it together. I'm assuming that's because you have one more in the village, but I would defer to your council. Mr. Okay. President, that is correct. We have okay. one prior, so this would be number two. So having said that, is that the end of your presentation? For now it is subject to answer any questions, unless there's questions now through the, through the, through the chair. That would, I would well, be fine. and we're gonna open it up. This is a public hearing that we're Correct. going to do. So we'll open that up to the public. And this is intended to just have the consideration of it being designated as a commercial rehabilitation exemption possibility. Right, so for the benefit of the public, uh, uh, Chairman Van Portfleet, there's two processes in approving this, and I know you know this, but just for the benefit of those that are coming for the first time. So the first one is a public hearing on whether the land or the real estate around this area would be considered a district. And that district says that the council said, you know what, we need to do something in the district that would consider that whether these types of certificates should be issued, and so you granted a resolution to create a district. All that does is give an opportunity 
for um, a group like ours to come in and ask for the second step, which we're here tonight. That's asking for a certificate of exemption. And what that means is, if approved, you're saying we agree to exempt a certain collection of taxes on the property. It doesn't exempt everything. It exempts those, it does not exempt the taxes that we're already paying on the property. But that portion but this is, is later in our agenda. Later in the agenda. The public hearing, though, is on whether you would grant that exemption certificate. That's what the public hearing is. So I'm going to open it up to the public. Is there any question? Well, public first. Open it up to the public. I've got a few names here on the cards, um, such as Mr. Breslin. You wish to comment on this West development project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so since this, the inception of this proposal, uh, myself and others have asked questions pertaining to what the impact of this would have financially through taxes, putting aside for the moment all of the inconvenience of the construction and the traffic and all of that. But the, uh, the hard costs in, in terms of tax burden that will fall upon the taxpaying residents of the village and I never did receive a, an answer for that, and I was under the impression that was being looked into. Um, so I still don't know what that answer is, um, although I can add to the list here the $7 million for a sewer pump that, if I understand correctly, for the tax abatement, they would be exempt from participating in, other than the use tax of the water. So it does not represent a burden on the taxpayers that are going to have to carry their weight while they're not paying taxes for 10 years? Mr. O'Neill, I believe you've put together some information on that, have you not? Well, basically, they're not exempt from fees that are, that are charged. This is only on the increased taxes that would be paid on the increased taxable Correct. value that they're putting in. Absolutely. The rest of it would remain the same. Right, so the use fees, they understand that, but the tax burden that the rest of the residents in the village will be paying, they will be exempt for from for 10 years. Well, the, the, there's not a greater burden on the rest of the taxpayers, it's just they're not paying the portion <coughs> of the taxes on the increased valuation. Well, the $7 million divided by the number of taxpaying parcels, isn't that how that math Mr. works? Mr. President, I'm gonna call a point of order. Again, public comments to the chair. Chair only, Thank you. it's really okay. not I'm time the one for debate. Deviate. Certainly, yeah. if council wants to ask questions of staff that are brought up by members of council, they certainly have the right. opportunity to do so. But yep. Sorry, sir, that's sure. My, sure. my error. Your comments are to be directed to me, and we'll add that, or the council can, in their debate to follow. Okay, so I guess, is there a simple yes, no answer to that? Is that something that that can be quantified, and, and, and again, that's, that's, that's been one of the things that has uh, really seemingly been not highlighted. You know, putting aside the, all the controversy about the DDA and the, where the money is going and all of that, I'm just looking at the hard costs of what this means, in addition to all the other turmoil that will result from this. I'm curious to, uh, to what, what impact that's gonna have on us. We'll look for that in debate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reard. Um, tax abatements well I'm on a couple of things here so um, I believe from what I was told when I was attempting to obviously get a tax abatement that you can't ask for it till your, your PUD is totally complete and your contract is signed uh, and that's what was what Joe Young told me at the time because I went through this for almost a year and I was told that by Mr. Young that you had to have everything all your T's and I's dotted and T's crossed before you can ask for that part. So I may be incorrect, but that's what I was told. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Childers, sir. My name is Jim Childers. I live at 197 West Flint Street. I've lived in Lake Orion since I was five years old. I live in the same house I live in now since 1959. I went to Blanche Sims. I graduated from Lake Orion High School in the class of 1967. This building over here that we're hoping to save was my junior high, fifth and sixth grade downstairs, seventh and eighth upstairs. I have a real soft spot in my heart for that building. We are losing so much history in this village through other developments 
the marina is right behind my property. So if you want to talk about construction upheaval, I will be experiencing that myself at some point. I'm, res I'm resolved that that is going to happen and I'm okay. Can't stop progress. Saving this building will be major progress for this village and will restore a building, not tear something down. It will restore a building that has been a part of this community since time immemorial. I would hope you would make the right decision that will benefit this community and keep history a part of it. Thank you, sir. That's the cards I have. Mr. Stevens, sir. Harry Stevens, 311 North Shore. Time and time again, I've spoken to this council about my abhorrence of tax abatements. This building that I also, I started in kindergarten and went to school throughout there. That is an old building. It was built in the 1920s, filled with asbestos with a steam heating plant. That's been known by the general population as well as the West Company from day one. It's going to take significant rehabilitation to do that, and I applaud them for the attempt to do so. But at the cost of tax revenue to the village, I have a problem. In this particular situation, we have the school itself, which is in tough shape, but very pleasant to look at. But we have another piece of the property that is to be developed. If there were to be an abatement, which I still don't agree with, I think it should only go with regard to the historical element, namely the school, that there should not be an abatement for the new properties. Those properties, or the new buildings, could be built on any piece of real estate within the community, and it doesn't have to be rehabilitated. That's a hill, it's been there forever, it's not a brownfield, it is a piece of naked property, and there should not be an abatement on that element. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Yes, Mr. Schmidt, sir. Jeff Schmitz, uh, JS Capital, 120 South Broadway developer. Um, I wanted to speak on behalf of some of the petitioners and some of the residents that wanted to talk about this tax abatement. So on the two tax abatements that have been brought before you, I assure you at the Eman Center, if nothing happens, nothing will get done. That building will deteriorate. And to the, you know, the residents who say that as a developer, you know, we're taking away, and I have no skin in the game on either one of these developments, but if you say that we're taking away tax revenue from the village on any of these issues, you're, you're asking about tax revenue that doesn't exist today. So what happens, because as a developer who's developed four million square feet of real estate in my lifetime, when you go in for these tax abatements, you will pay the same tax revenue that that property is currently paying today. It's paid last year, the year before, and the years to come, if nothing happens. The great thing about it is, and, and some of you gentlemen talked about graduating from Lake Orion High School, you're not exempt from the increase in taxes for the school system. So your school taxes will double or triple or whatever they may be in accordance with the value of your asset. But the, what you're not capturing from a village is the increased value. So your school taxes as a developer are gonna go up, but your, your, your base taxes to the village and the county are gonna stay stagnant for 10 years. But I assure you as a developer, if you do nothing and give nothing to these people that are trying to develop assets and make the community better and more vibrant, I assure you those buildings will sit there vacant for the next 30 years. Because it, as a developer, you do not understand what we go through when interest rates are going to 8% and your cost to buy a gallon of milk is $8 and a two by four is $14. 
So if you're okay with letting that piece of real estate deteriorate year after year after year, then don't vote for it. But it, when you look at the most successful communities in Michigan, Traverse City, Royal Oak, Rochester, do you disagree with those? They all have strong DDAs which promote these incentives that go forward. That's all I got to say. Anyone else? <laughs> okay, at this point, the intention was just to hold a public hearing on this item. No action needed. If there's no additional public comment, we'll close and move on in the agenda. Item nine, items for consideration. Invoice approval, October 11th, 2022, invoices for approval along with credit card statement. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Josh Johnson, our finance director, treasurer, is here to answer any questions that you have. I've taken a look at the uh, invoices and don't find anything unremarkable. Entertain a motion. I move to approve the bills in the amount of $136,469.77, of which $7,567.09 are DDA bills for a net total of $144,036.86 are approved for payment along with a credit card statement of $3,044.76 to receive and file. Support, discussion, questions, challenges? Are there any? Roll call, please. Hobbs? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Luxinger? Yes. Narsh? Yes. Van Forkley? Yes. Matheson? Yes. Brooke? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Item 2 September financial statements. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. President, and members of the Council. Again, this is your uh, activity report for September. I've reviewed it. I don't find anything remarkable. You, hopefully the audit is going to be presented to you in November of the last year. You can use that to compare with this to see exactly where you're at financially, and we will have additional information should it be needed so that you're up to date. Thank you. Entertain a motion. I move to receive and file the financial reports for September 2022. Second. Questions? Challenges. I just want to mention that in discussion with the village manager um, about the overall fund balance, because we're talking quite frequently about money, and this is part of that. This is our review. It is in June of this year, at the end of the 21 22, we had a growth in our general fund of $55,000. And if I look at all net of revenues and expenditures and our all funds, total revenues of all funds, um, and Josh, you might even use supply this report, there was a, in 21-22, the year balance was 450 net of revenues and expenditures, 456,000 is the number that I got from your report as well. A little bit different than the first <coughs> fund balance, the general fund, but <clears throat> we're working the best we can to watch the money. All those in favor of accepting the financial reports, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Okay. Item B, number one, application for exemption certificate for West Village, 55 West Elizabeth Street. Mr. O'Neill. Would you like to kick this off again? Again, this, is, this I would refer to the village attorney. He has been intimately involved with this for the last several months and going back to 2021. So I would uh, refer to Mr. Mikowski. Mr. President, thank you. As, as mentioned earlier, you have correspondence. I've attached not only this statute, but uh, the simplified uh, version from the state uh, summary sheet and a question and answer. Uh, based on that, uh, obviously, uh, council's urge to 
consider all those uh, elements outlined in the letter and in those correspondence uh, and whether or not to grant the exemption certificate requested for. And uh, if you grant or deny, again, we will probably need to discuss uh, the, the, the fill in the blank parts of the relevant uh, proposed resolution. And, and I kind of propose a question to start. Did you get both res proposed resolutions? You just got the one. So if it turns to a denial, uh, I, I can make some quick copies for, for council's preview. I, I just noticed that <laughs> this morning and uh, I don't think we had enough time. But just so you're aware, we did provide both, both versions of a resolution not knowing which direction council was going to choose to take. I would like to, I, Mr. Gibb, do you have anything you'd like to say from the developer side? Now is your opportunity again. You were talking about it earlier, about the money. In our brief, because we haven't said this to the public, it says here, our summary sheet, Village Council has established a commercial rehabilitation district for the property located at 55 West Street. West Village is now applying for exemption certificate under Public Act 210 for 55 West Elizabeth Street. Summary of previous council action. On July 25th, the Village Council had a public hearing and passed a resolution 2022-032 establishing the commercial rehabilitation district number two for 55 East Elizabeth Street at the September 12th, 2022 council meeting. We just did a public hearing. Now we're looking at the exemption certificate. Financial impact is approximately 50 to 60,000 <coughs> annual tax abatements. Correct? Well, I can confirm, but that would be a, an average over the 10 year period. So it wouldn't be necessarily $53,000 immediately because of the way the project would get assessed, um, but you're correct. That, that amount would be restricted from the DDA budget because currently the property's in the DDA. Okay. And that's a 10-year program? It's a 10-year program. That's correct. Okay. All right. So well, I'm, I'm going to offer up, uh, get the debate started. So um, I'm going to recommend a motion to adopt the resolution number two or 2022-042, uh, approving the application for exemption certificate for West Village 55 West Elizabeth Street. Second. Typically, what we would do is we'd offer in this some more additional public comment if need be. We already heard from the public on this earlier, and I would go ahead, Mr. Narsh. Um, and with that, I, I mean, I made the motion, right? Um, but I, I also wanted to comment, I listened to all the comments, everybody, both sides. Um, I've had an optic um, over the last 38 years of watching that building and watching that property, policing it, um, keeping drug use out of it, uh, potential arson from inside of it, uh, people breaking into it, um, the constant crime, uh, the constant vandalism. And I look at it as an old car that we've had as a community sitting out front, and we've had a for sale sign on it. And this is, as. Uh, Mr. Schmidt spoke as a developer. So here's a piece of property with a historic building sitting out there for 30 years and everybody just drove by, nobody stopped. We had a couple stop and inquire, um, but nobody really wanted that old car. Nobody kicked the tires. We finally got a very reputable developer on historic property come in and that's kind of my belief as well, is there's gotta be a big dog in the hunt for me to want to offer that tax abatement, and in this case, this historic preservation of our original school and our high school, um, I think is priceless. Not only that, um, we, as stated, we're, we're not losing all of the tax base that's there that will continue. And not only will that continue, we will increase our water usage and those fees that will come into the village, people will move in here who will buy products downtown. They will live and work in the village quite possibly. You're increasing exponentially those incomes back into our community. And I've watched developments for the last 40 years 
that have been good for us. And I, I think this is the prime example of that. And, and I, I really express uh, that desire to see this blighted property improve. Thank you. Thank you. Any other additional comments, Mr. Lamb? Thank you, Mr. <laughs> President. So <clears throat> over the last several years, I, I've been driving around the village and talking to the people. And most of the people I talk to don't care about the high school. My high school was torn down and turned into a gymnasium. It's a beautiful building. Most of the residents I've talked to could care less about the high school. Uh, they don't want to spend a half a million dollar in tax revenues to support a developer to make a lot of money off the project. I think Mr. Mr. Um, Stevens was correct in saying that when we come in and ask for 100% tax abatement for 10 years and we can't do the project without that money and then we pay a million dollars for a piece of property that costs $51,000 and then we have three $40,000 million, $40 million projects uh, along the lake shore, I I'm not seeing the, the desperate need for a, a tax abatement. I'm still trying to figure why the tax abatement was issued for uh, the four-story building downtown, why there's a four-story building downtown on, you know, one of the nicest sites in the village. So, uh, you know, I'm going to delabor the point. So I am totally do not believe these people are eligible under the law. I mentioned that to council before. And I don't believe that the village residents want to give any tax abatements. I understand the developer is a high-quality development firm and that will do a good job. But um, me and my people don't don't see it that way. So that's my opinion. I have a few more comments. <clears throat> Those whole processes are very deceiving and deceitful uh, to the residents. We go through each stage and the developer comes and makes a presentation and then we, you know, we create a special district and then, you know, everybody's blah, blah, and then we create a application process, then we, we create a certificate and then in the end we have a vote and they get their 10 year 100% tax payment. Yeah, I'm willing to, to bet that that's what they're going to get. So I feel the grease under the skids, and I don't support this. Thank you. Ms. Rutt. I, I think it's important to note that the village is not actually spending money when granting a tax abatement. We are simply not collecting, or whoever, you know, wherever that money goes, they're not collecting for the 10 years. We're not spending any money. And I think it's also important to note, as Mr. Narsh said, that it's been sitting there vacant for years. If it doesn't get developed, we're still only going to be collecting the current taxes that are happening right now. So five years from now, is it going to be developed? I suspect not. Seven years from now, is it going, 10 years from now, when you know all the taxes will be captured, will it be developed? I suspect not, based on history and how long that property sat there. So we're abating for 10 years for a future long-term gain. And I, I just don't see the logic in saying, no, we're not going to do that, when it's a project that so many in the community does support the historic preservation. We've heard for weeks now, historic preservation, historic preservation. Well, we have people who want to do historic preservation, and then just to say, oh, no, well, short-term, we're not going to get the money. So we're, not, we're going to say no, well, we're not going to get historic preservation and we're not going to get the taxes long term. So it just doesn't make sense for me to, to deny it without any future prospect of additional revenue in the next 10 years. Nobody's lining up and knocking on the door for that property to develop it. Anyone else? Mr. Hobbs. Now let me put it in my simple mind here. Um, so if it gets the abatement, not, nothing's lost to the village. In, in the long run, after the 10 years, we start getting taxes off it, right? Okay, so that's, that's, an, that's how I'm thinking. And uh, the, the Westfell project down in Pontiac, I've seen the, the Strand Theater, and if anyone can pull it off, they can. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm for it. Anyone else? I have a couple of comments and questions, sir. <clears throat> I believe that school has set 
uh, blighted property for all of about 35 years now. That's correct. <clears throat> I have witnessed, well, I, I'm going to take a guess at this, but probably five to seven uh, efforts to do something with that property, whether it's different owners or development considerations, and <coughs> nothing has happened. And its path is to remain as blighted property. And the people I talk to are asking that we do something with it. And these are people that have attended there or haven't attended there, are just looking for the betterment of the community. Even such as um, Mr. Torek, who is a neighbor across the street. He has been in here a number of times and made statements to that effect as well. Do something with the building. There's no uh, deception or uh, deceit here in the intent of what to do with this property. There's no previous greasing of the skids. This is just trying to make the best decisions for the community. So I have a couple of questions regarding that. So fifty to sixty thousand dollars. You made the statement the minimal amount required for participation with the MEDC. The thing I keep thinking about is the Michigan Economic Development um, Council says, look, in order for us to assist you, the developers, with this property, we need to have buy-in from the community. <coughs> Accurate? That's a requirement, <coughs> yes. An absolute requirement. If we say no tonight, you don't get assistance in your financing from the MEDC. You are cold. You're out there with no assistance, correct? That's correct. And, and if I could, Chair, I would add to that that um, I, that financing is required to secure all of the other financing, including their own personal equity that the firm is putting in to make that happen. It's uh, no different than when you you buy a house, you have to have a certain amount of your own equity in order to close on that. We're in the same position here. Every dollar that the MEDC is pledging is coordinated with the dollars that we're asking here to complete the, the total construction. And I would note for you and the public and the rest of the council that this is all originally based upon the estimate of this being approximately 21 to $22 million of total investment cost for the project. Because uh, as Mr. Schmidt said, Developers are now facing the fact that when we started this, construction materials were at a certain cost, but particularly the cost of building something, including wage and labor. This is probably more likely 26 or $27 million mm -hmm. um, of total investment cost. And so you are very accurate. These dollars are very, very structured in the way that if, if this is not able to help participate with the MEDC, it is impossible that any developer would be able to develop this property. Right. You're the owners of the property, pack up, go home, figure out something else, yeah. maybe sell it. Maybe. Yeah. Last time it went to the state land bank, which is why it ended up being disposed of like it was. Right. Okay, now the question. Fifty, sixty thousand dollars a minimal amount. Where does that come from? How is that derived? So as has been said many times, that's right, I appreciate your analysis as well on this, is that that amount is, is from the increase in taxable value of the property. So right now the property is worth a certain amount of money. Uh, there's taxes that are being paid. Uh, there's a very minimal amount of other fees that are being paid to the village because the property is obsolete and has been rendered uh, in a blight status for quite some time. That increased value is where that, that taxable amount comes from. So if the increase in value goes up a million dollars, then you would pay the millage rate to the village based upon that million dollars of increase. So as the project is built, um, all the taxes are held, uh, at just like it would for any project, but then as it's reassessed once it's completed, whatever that increase in value is, that's the portion that's abated. So the base still gets paid. And picking up on a point that, that Mr. Narsh made, uh, we submitted in our application materials, uh, and very important for the public to recognize this, that we had a very detailed statement of economic impact. It's one thing to say that the village is not going to collect that increase in valuation for a period of 10 years. It's much more significant to say that if this were to be turned down, that the village is not going to collect the economic impact, which when you have 89 market rate units 
in a place like the village of Lake Orion, the economic impact, as all of you know, my prior job was to know these numbers very, very clearly, is somewhere in the tune of $280 million over the life of this abatement, which for the public might sound, oh, it's a developer making up numbers. We look at the average incomes that would go into these units. We look at the cost of the units that people are paying in rents, the rents that the market would demand, and we multiply that into a factor that's very clearly identified. So you're losing 50 or $60,000 of currently uncollected, and quite frankly, if the project can't go forward, never collected revenue in exchange for the economic impact that would drive. And I would say I applaud how the village has been handled and the way that it's grown with very good stewardship. I've lived here now 30 plus years, which many people would say, oh, you just moved in. Um, uh, seeing it grow, seeing Mr. Schmidt's project and other, that's the residual impact of economic uh, development and impact. When you bring income into your community, you do it in a very smart and steward-like way. This project is gonna bring far greater impact to you and your budget in the years to come than the minimum amount of taxes that you will be not collecting as a result of the increased value. You stated $280 million over 10 years, $28 million a year in economic uh, uh, income or people are gonna be living here, eating here. Um, people buying other houses. The right. construction impact alone the first year and a half, there'll be close to 190 construction workers that will be on site. When you bring those type of people into a community, there is a residual economic impact. Uh, it, it, it's not a, the only selling factor for why this should happen. You've pointed out several, but it's significant. Those are the things. When the General Motors plant was, was preserved in the south end of this town, the economic impact of that was, was immeasurable. Doing these types of projects, particularly a historic preservation project, where you are keeping the integrity of the community, it's, it's immeasurable almost. And at the MEDC level, the historic preservation, that's huge the need there for our participation for you to obtain that. Well, I, I would note for the benefit, your good counsel has pointed out that for the purpose of a resolution that would say, what is the eligible criteria? There's, there's three real key criteria here that are under the statute. Uh, one of them, as you pointed out, uh, Village President Van Portfleet, that the property has been um, vacant and obsolete for greater than 15 years. And when you have a situation, it creates one element of el eligibility. The next one, very significant under the statute, that it is involves direct historic preservation in a community. Uh, we have checked two of the major boxes of the statute, not of the, well, should we do it? It's two major eligibility boxes. The third box that checks us here is, is that will there be improvement to public infrastructure? Well, we've already made it very clear that we're gonna not, not only be improving the localized utility system for the project, but the roadways are going to be improved. The off-street parking that will be improved by paving, marking, curbing, lining, all of those things that will surround the project are all significant eligible elements of a Public Act 210 application. And so those three factors of eligibility render this completely eligible under the law. And I would encourage you to include that in your record if you're inclined to approve a resolution. Ms. Rutt. Uh, just a quick, um, for clarification, with Mr. Narsh's motion, does he have to also, where it's read in here, include pick the option, because there are options on the resolution? Correct, and I, okay. think, I think it would be appropriate for council to maybe debate those, and, and, and then Mr. Narsh can maybe amend his motion okay. to would, include what options. Um, okay, I was gonna ask, would that be a separate motion after it's enacted? Because if we, well, if I include them in the motion, and we haven't passed it yet, then we're including such as under the whereas uh, option two, uh, would these be two motions or one? I think you can do it in one, but okay. if you're more comfortable doing it in two, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm wondering um, how it could be done in two. If it says to adopt the resolution, if the resolution isn't complete, how exactly. do we? Exactly. Okay. okay. Usually these things, you have the public hearing, have the debate, then come back with a proposed resolution kind of, because um, you do have, I think the statute provides 60 days from the date of the public hearing. The, the attempt was to move it along because it did get delayed for this public hearing and they want to move forward as fast as possible. So we were trying to shoot from the hip, so to speak, to give you the tools to uh, possibly consider a motion. So if maybe you want to amend okay. your motion. And, and I will amend my motion. And the next question is, are we going to read in my amended motion the entire? No. Or are we going to make those, and if so, I'll if we're making those, 
I'll bring up to this body for debate. Uh, the first uh, section in red is option one, uh, option two, and option three. I'm proposing option two in my motion. Okay. Uh, in addition to my motion, I would ask um, the development is okay. part of is the village of Lake Murray requires that the rehabilitation of the facility shall be completed by. I got to put a date. Okay. I want a date. You had a timeline of October 2024, was that correct? That the completed by. December 2025? Okay. That's, that's, no, that's, that's 26. That's 26 months. I think we can go faster than 26 months. Well, yeah. yeah. I just, so just I, the case. Yeah. Oh. All the developers in the crowd are saying we're waiting 80 months for switchgear. So. Um, if we could put December 2025 as our anticipated full completion date, then okay. that, that would be reasonable. And I've, I've got that. And, uh, and for the purpose of amending my motion, I'm including uh, the top of page three of three, all those sections in red, to include increased commercial activity, create employment, retain employment, prevent a loss of employment, revitalize urban areas, or increase the number of residents in the community. And in addition, the now therefore be it resolved, I would include that for a period of 10 years, beginning December 31st, 2022, and ending December 30th, 2032. And that would conclude. If, if Mr. Chair, if I could just have a point of order, yes, and maybe even include your, your good counsel. So Mr. Narsh, uh, typically the way that an abatement would structure from the dates, and those dates might be from our original application, <coughs> is you would time the beginning of the abatement period at the end of the construction cycle. Now you have discretion over when you want that to start. If you were to say that we would time this so that it would start at the beginning of 2025 instead of at the end of 2025, that's your discretion. But if you start it right now, then uh, we would lose the benefit of almost three years of the abatement which changes substantially what we've been working on at the state. So the intent is to have the abatement start at the completion of the project? At, at the completion of construction. So then I would amend. Well, Mr. Chair, I. Um, well, if, Council. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt, Mr. Marsh. Need to double check that because I'm not sure the statute provides for that. Um, if I could have a moment to look at the statute because I thought it said yeah. that once granted, it has to commence the December 31st of the year that it's granted. So if I could just have a moment to find that language. And I could be wrong. And I understand their request, but yeah. we've got to follow the statute. So Ms. Rutt has another question, Mr. Gibb. Sure. Yeah, sure, I'm looking sure. at the timeline. It was provided for us on packet page 70. And so just wondering if this is still an accurate timeline. So it says September 22, 22 government approvals, October 22 finance approvals, December 22 finance closing, April 23 start construction, October 23 start pre-leasing, July 24 construction completion, October 24 complete lease up. Is that still the targeted so, timeline? Uh, and I apologize, we didn't amend the application again. That was the application that we submitted back in May under your pri prior manager to move forward. So really all of those timelines you would just move probably five months. Uh, so we're here, hopefully, to get government approval at this step. Finance approval then would likely be January, um, which is a little bit quicker than, than, than we might think. Uh, of course, you're then winter, construction timing, and ramp up. So I would just push that whole timetable back five months, and that really pushes to Mr. Narsh what you just said is a construction completion. Would it be fair to include, the, would it be possible to include language at this piece of the resolution to simply state that the 10 year period would start and end based on the guideline of the statute. And therefore we don't have to research that this evening. And if that would be fair to all parties, if we're meeting the law. I, I found it. You found it? Okay. 
except as otherwise provided in Section 8.4, which we'll look at in a sec second. The effective date of the certificate is the December 31st, immediately following the date of issuance of the certificate. So, as outlined in my letter to the council, obviously, if you issue a certificate, it has to go to the, uh, the state, and then the state has an opportunity to approve or reject. Uh, assuming they approve within the time frame they're supposed to approve, that'll be prior to December 31st, 2020. So I, unfortunately, for the applicant, read the statute as saying that I, the state will automatically do that and issue the certificate for December 31st, immediately following the date of issuance, and, and that, except for 8-4. So let me just look at 8-4 really quick. And I'd like to remind everyone that um, council just mentioned that the state tax commission <coughs> will review this as well if approved to make sure that the approval is accurate and you fit the criteria as well do you have something you'd like and to the, add? yeah i have a question for council thank you so uh option two and option three so option two says the application was approved for 10 years period Option three, the application was approved for a blank year and the certificate will not be extended. Is that language intentionally left vague in option two about an extension? You mean option three? No, I mean, is it intentionally vague as to whether or not an extension is an option in option two? I'm sorry. But you're talking it, doesn't, about it doesn't forbid. Right. An option, right? Extension. So option two, there could be an extension. No. Is that no? You can't no. go past ten years. No, ten the years. Statute is, doesn't yeah. allow more than ten years. That okay. is the maximum. They're requesting the maximum of ten years. You do have the ability to grant less than ten years if you so choose, or grant ten years with conditions for extensions after a certain amount of time. That's thus the reason for those options. Thus the reason if. If, like option three, the application, you approved it for five years and said, we're, we're only giving you five and we're not giving you 10 and we're not going to extend it. Uh, so that's what that's intended to uh, basically suit what's defined in the statute for what your options are for the uh, requested abatement. So the reason it's 10 years, it's specific because they can't go past it. Okay. Period. For the clerk. Mr. Lane. Uh, for the point of more useless rhetoric, I got this packet on Friday with all these proposed resolutions and detailed legal briefs of, of uh, things, okay? I'm curious to know why there's been no discussion of, uh, all I've heard from the developer is I have to have a 10 year uh, maximum tax abatement for the entire property. But in these proposed resolutions and things, it says, oh, we have the option to give them a resolution for one year and renew it. We have the option to give it to them for five years and renew it. We have some options. So what really, you know, what really truthfully is the, you know, minimum requirement for the tax abatement for their outside government funding? No one ever asked the question. I've never heard a word of it from anyone. And so no comment. So that's why I, I talk about the grease. And, uh, you know, why was no one's interested in ameliorating the suffering of the residents in these kind of situations. Mr. Gabe, do you have any comments on that? The, there's a detailed pro forma that has to go to the state of Michigan, and what I mean by that is they look at every, every dollar that's to be expended, the projected value of the project, the guarantees of re return, the stability of the developer, the financial capital that will go into it. It's all really, quite frankly, down to the dollar. Um, in every aspect. Uh, when all of that gets analyzed, the MEDC bases their recommendation upon, uh, in this case, a 10-year abatement in lieu of some of the other opportunities that were available. Uh, and so we're making a request for the full 10 years, knowing how this tax is going to project out, because the total pro forma package to the state uh, relies on it. And I, I hate to say that, Mr. Lamb. You say, oh, it's a developer saying, well, we have to have it. Well, in this case, in order to do this particular project, we, we just do. And, and I would also comment that uh, that was my motion. And if my motion doesn't pass, um, there could be another debate on that. But I, I mean, I took into consideration the state requirement 
uh, the return on investment that has to happen on this thing. It's been scaled back, scaled back at the request of the public. We've had meetings. And so they've lost uh, return on investment. So that, that debate resulted in a finer product, I think, that the community likes better. Um, and you look at uh, the decay that's been there and what was so eloquently brought out over the next 10 years, what we're not going to get if it continues to sit. Um, so that's why I included uh, option two in my motion. And, and at this point, my motion stands on option two but I would like to go back to, to make my motion correct. Are we then statutorily required uh, to what my original motion was, December 31st, 2022 to December 31st, 2032? I believe that's how the statute reads. And it obviously we, when we, the, we, we like the law, follow the law, whatever law is. <laughs> okay. Other, other, my, other my communities put, yeah, that's fine. on those dates. Uh, for our attorney and for uh, counsel if that's statutorily required. And, and the STC will issue that certificate and put those dates in there for if, since your motion is for 10 years and if that passes, uh, they'll issue it for that and basically tell us, but I'm quite confident that it's that date. You good with that, Mr. Gibb? Like I say, we want to work with the community. We like the law, so okay. that's the basis. Right. I mean, just for the benefit of you and the public that um, uh, because of the way ad valorem taxes are assessed and drawn, that, that really doesn't kick in until the following I get it. tax year anyway. So, <laughs> right. um, so, and when we talk, talk about the state, we're talking about the State Tax Commission, right. the STC. Right. And I would like to add that <clears throat> I believe I read and I believe this is the case with the other um, abatements that we've done. I'm not a fan of them, quite honestly, but uh, special needs require special action. Special opportunities require special action. But there is an annual review to make sure that you're fulfilling criteria of additional jobs and so on and so forth that is sent in. Again, that data is provided and sent in as part of a re, um, just a, a review process. The state of Michigan requires a review on, on each of their incentives that's been in, in the process now for about 10 years or so. I would indicate for your benefit, the public, I'm sure your council knows this, that this certificate is revocable. Um, you have to have criteria, meaning if this developer can't pull it off, if uh, they, uh, they don't come through with the public space that they've described in their PUD, all of those types of reasons that this community can look and seek to revoke it, they would have to go through a very similar process. All of that is a safeguard and for the purpose of the public to say, well, it seems like it's drawn out. It seems like you, okay, only one step at a time. All of that's for the safeguard of you and the public. Um, developers would prefer, I'm sure those that are here would prefer if we could just come to one meeting and, and, and have our case served, that would be awesome. But it's all for the benefit of preservation for the public voice. You can revoke the certificate if the criteria that you found, it turns out that we stood up here and lied. If the numbers that we're talking about are not true because we committed a fraud. If uh, we only build half the project, all those reasons you can look to revoke the certificate at a future date. My support still. Okay, so yeah. that was just yeah. my question. Like, do procedurally, do you still support? Yeah. Ms. Ruff, did you know that? No, that was just it. I, I didn't okay. hear that yep. before, so. Mr. Lane? Might I suggest that we call the question? All the commissioners okay. have spoken except for Brad. And uh, I think to let these people go home, it would be great. And. Council, anything else that you'd like to add, sir? Um, I don't know if you're interested in actual taxable value as it stands right now. I have that number from Oakland County Equalization that I got last week. Uh, Is that required in the motion? No, it's the not resolution? required in okay. the motion. I know you were interested in numbers and, you know, obviously that's one number and that will be taxed and the village will receive the taxes on that taxable value. And it's kind of up in the air what the assessed and new taxable value is when it's completed or near completion and reassessed, and thus the reason for the estimate of that increase in taxable value uh, that will not be realized for a period of time. Okay. Any other council comments? Mr. O'Neill. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. President, members of the council. Uh, Mr. President, you asked me today if I had experience with the 210, and I told you I did not. Uh, I remember now, when I was in another community, the city of Howell, 
I was out there in the late 90s and they had a lot of these two tens with the Maribuni and a lot of the big ones out there. And what the assessor would do would get these reports that would come from the MEDC and whoever, and they watch this real closely. And they watch to make sure that they meet their guidelines and if they don't, they come back to the council. Sure. I've witnessed that as well, that's why I brought it up. Anything else? All right, uh, roll call please. Lamb? No. Luxinger? Yes. Matheson? Yes. Narsh? Yes. Brutt? Yes. Van Fortley? Yes. Hobbs? Yes. Thank you. Carry 6 1. Thank you. Okay. Moving on the agenda West Village PUD extension. Okay. Don't go away. Shoot, I thought I was leaving. <laughs> All right. Make your case, sir. So uh, as you uh, ad nauseum know that we're working on this diligently, your ordinance actually provides a request to extend our PUD approval. We gained that planned unit development, the preliminary approval, um, almost six months ago. That time period is about to expire. We set forth in our letter to you through your good clerk that um, the criteria is simply that we've had um, erstwhile diligence uh, we have. We've out outlined that tonight. Um, I would just incorporate all those comments again. We're not asking for uh, the moon on this, if we could get a six month extension so that we could complete the planning process. Um, uh, now that we know that we're moving with the MEDC, that should be sufficient. Six months would be sufficient? I think so. Six months to get through planning commission? Mr. President. Do, right? For the PUD. No, 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 it's just through just confirming the PUD, yeah. Yeah, yeah six months. Mr. Lamb. I move to extend the PUD as the petitioner is requested. Right now, in our recommendation, it says one year. You're asking six months. Well, we'll, so? we'll take a year. I just didn't want to be greedy. That's all. Does that change your mind? Yeah, I mean, we'd rather have a year, but. I um, thought he said six. Six months is fine. Okay, so we have a motion for six month extension on the PUD. I'll support. Discussion. Just one clarification, Council President. Uh, yes. We're assuming that's the six months from the date of expiration. So whatever that date is that it would otherwise expire. You agree, sir? It would be six months. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I amend my support and agree as well. Okay. <coughs> All those in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's, excuse me, Mr. President. Sure. Next agenda item is item three, which is disposition of TIF petition. And Mr. O'Neill, sir, would you like to open this up? Yes, I would, Mr. President, members of the board. Uh, Mr. Harry Stevens has requested that this item appear on the agenda tonight. Uh, he wants to talk about a timeline of supporting documents regarding the petition drive for petition on ordinance number 36.05 is requesting that the village council take affirmative action on the petition or schedule a special election uh, for the question on the petition and as you'll see uh, uh, referred just to the, the city attorney for the comments that he and the way he has directed the village board in the past okay so we have a recommendation the village attorney should be consulted on this, but I would like to ask Mr. Stevens, sir, would you like to come up and do a presentation or discussion or anything you'd like to add, sir, or? <coughs> Harry Stevens, 311 North Shore. Uh, if I could just step back to the last issue, uh, I believe the taxes there may be on the Eman Center and those properties, are they not part of the DDA's taxation TIF program. Uh, that, that property would have been free of taxes, I believe, when it was in the school district and then when it was purchased by somebody, it would seem as though that becomes a tax roll 
and then, but that was 37, 35 years ago or so. So maybe that money that's being paid is being captured by the by the TIF. I'm not sure. Didn't study it. So just as a, a thought. Um, I'd like to paint a picture of what 37 years ago looked like. Surely. Yeah, thank you. Thank I just you. have trouble hearing you. Hope I don't sneeze. Uh, <clears throat> the council in 1985 that, that passed this original ordinance, which was 3601, uh, four have passed away, three are still alive, and only one still lives in Lake Orion. You. Just, just a point of interest. Uh, the 19, or excuse me, the 2022 council, uh, two were residents in 1985, as far as I can figure. Uh, that'd be Mr. Narsh and, and Mr. Van Portfleet, I believe. Um, probably two weren't even born yet, or if they were, they were very young. Uh, Van Portfleet's son, Sam, wasn't born. Mr. Narsh, he was near early experiences of his policehood in starting his young family at that time. And I was at the meeting in 1985. Pardon me? I said I was at the meeting in 1985. You probably remember it intimately. I, I didn't live here. And some of the village council members weren't old enough to vote in that year. Uh, a history, uh, the USSR still existed at that time. That didn't break down until 1991. The Berlin Wall existed until 1989, so that was another historical event that was there. President Ronald Reagan was in his first term, and we've either had six or seven presidents since then. 37 years was a long time. Financially, $100 in 1985 is now worth $277, or a 277% increase caused by inflation. An average loaf of bread in 1985 cost 79 cents. Today, it's $2.50. I think that's a little low, but that's what the statistics say. Uh, average gallon of gas in 1985 was $1.20. They claim now it's $4.99. Maybe not here, but nationally, that's the number. Average cost of a car was $6,298. Today, he estimated it to be around $40,000. The Dow Jones in 1985 was 1500 Today, it's around 29000 Things have gotten expensive over the years, caused by inflation and things of that nature. DDA and TIF stats. In 1985, there were 992 people who lived in the district. And that's according to the 3601 original document for the DDA and TIF. The initial SEV for the district was $6,203,000. And the captured amount in 1986 was $11,326. Now back in those days, we could capture school money. That got changed, so I netted out the school money. This is the actual comparable to what we have today. Again, from the uh, original 3601, the average projected capital uh, capture for the first year was going to be 21,000, for the first 10 years, excuse me, was $21,520 per year, or $215,000 for the entire term of the 10 years. The next 10 years, which was projected, uh, was going to be for a total of the 10 years of 486,561. With a very nice gesture by Ms. Spallone, uh, she gave me the information for what it is for this year, 2022 and 2023. And the capture from taxes is 871,278, and I thank you very much for that. So that's my, my story for the histor historical of this. So because of these types of things, that's what started me off on changing the financial situation for our village. And so I'm going to read casually basically what I have sent and you have had before, but so it gets into the public record 
we'll just read it for them. Uh, council members, my request is to either the council to take affirmative action on our petition or take the petition to a special election. And that is the bottom line of what we're calling for. This petition process is very difficult and confusing as witnessed by the comments by myself and the village attorney at several occasions. I also suggest that it's unfair and beset with the delays and instructions. I have included in this packet a number of separate documents that I have numbered so as to make reference to my arguments. Number one was a calendar identifying the timelines of things that have taken place. On the week of June 13, I started gathering information on how to do a petition, and I'm a layperson. I don't know how to do that. I met with the village clerk, and she directed me to contact the township clerk and suggested contacting Joe Rizal, who is the Oakland County elections official. Uh, and I took those suggestions. On June 24th and 23rd and 24th, I tried to call Mr. Rosell several times, leaving messages, and never got a response to it. June 29th, I emailed Representative Riley and was told that his office could not give directions on how to prepare a petition. And such questions as what is the wording? Who approves the wording? When do they have to be turned in? Basic fundamental things, nothing. Uh, the week of July 5th, I went to the Oakland County Elections Office to contact her, Mr. Roselle, who was not available. I talked to his election staff and was given one copy of a blank copy of the county and local proposal petition form and told to hire an attorney. That was the help that I got. Being a little bit bullheaded, I continued on and took my guidance from other petitions that I looked and read at and tried to clone the wording to do such. In the week of uh, July 18th, I prepared my first doc, uh, petition. I asked the village clerk for a copy of the DDN TIF ordinance and was given the ordinance 3601, and that's how I wrote the petition. I put that out and in one day found out, oh, that is the original. We have four amendments onto it. So I rewrote the petition to now 3605. And the 35th was the first signature on that first petition, and it was by one of your council members. On the 26th, I discovered an error on the petition regarding the ordinance number, changed it to the petition that is the 3506, which I just referenced. July 29th, I started the second petition drive. On August 2nd, I turned the second set of petitions to the village clerk with 356 petitions at 2.25 p.m. On August 4th, the village interim village manager personally delivered the petitions to the township clerk at 10.30 in the morning. And I thank him for that. Uh, it turns out, really, I could have taken it to the uh, township clerk and avoided the delay that was there, but I wasn't aware that that was an option since they were received by the village We have clerk. quite a bit more of this letter, if you might. Yes. Stay with that for us. I'd appreciate right. that. August 5th, the township clerk tried to return the verified position of the village administration office, but was unable to because the new policy being closed on Fridays. She gave it to the police department. This is a copy of the instruction handing in the petition. Note not a single mention of the need to fill out the upper right hand portion of the petition. I consider this, consider this an inappropriate instruction for how to complete the form. And I gave you a copy of the uh, form and the entire side that has the explanations for how to fill out the form had no mention whatsoever of that one little box up on the upper right hand corner on the front. And that is why we had a failure on number two petition. August 8th, document three, my letter identifying that the petitions didn't contain sufficient number of signatures and there was an error because the box in the upper right of the petition nullified 22 of the signed petition sheets. And that's what I made reference to as poor instructions. They were not clearly identified in the instruction panel. Uh, a six-page option letter by uh, Attorney Davis of the DDA identified the def uh, def 
and defending the position regarding the error of the 22 positions. Uh, I will leave out my editorial comment on that uh, for reasons. On August 10th, started the third petition drive. On August 11th, completed the third petition drive with a combination of signature of 410 signatures. August 12th, a Friday, turned in the third set of petitions into the township clerk because the village was closed on Fridays. At 8.30 in the morning, the village administration was closed. August 15th, informed not good enough signatures short by less than 10. August 15th, uh, whoops, where am I now? Forget Document that. Six, six. Yeah. Sixteenth started the fourth petition drive. Seventeenth, fourth petition drive turned into the township clerk. <laughs> On August 18th, the village clerk emailed me at 11 or at 10, 941 notifying that there were 378 verified good signatures. Also another inter, uh, email stating the petition be presented to the council on 822. The village attorney's letter of August 16th questions the village charter law versus state law specifying articles of stuff, which is aforementioned in my reading simply states that the state in the text of the words of the mentioned the governor, the House of Representatives, and two-thirds vote of both houses. That obviously doesn't apply to our village because we don't have a governor, we don't have two-thirds houses. Therefore, I suggest that the village charter is what would prevail. We are given instructions on how to handle this uh, in chapter seven of, of, our, of our ordinances. And that is reasonably clearly explained that the options on that, and I'm gonna quote that, if a referendum petition repealing an ordinance to which the petition refers is determined to submit the proposal to the electors of the village. The other option is for the council to make the decision for them since you are the elected body of, the, uh, of our community. Considering the fact that four days or three and a half days were lost due to placement of the petitions within the village offices and the fact that the village offices are now closed on Friday and limited the ability of the information to be shared. I believe it's fair to say that about three and a half days of my time frame was lost. If those three and a half days were taken in, this petition would have been presented for the November 8th election because it would have met the time frame of meeting that which was August 16th at 4 p.m. Based on those facts and the height, I feel that because of confusing and lack of guidance, petition to form and poor instructions and loss of those three and a half days that I should have some consideration. I respectively request that the Lake Orion Village Council to enact the ordinance that as we're talking about, which is 7.8B and of the petitions that can call for a special election or offer the citizens the opportunity to make the decision. 378 of your constituents have asked you to act. Thank you. Thank you, sir. At this time, I have a couple of the speaker cards of people that would like to speak as well before council gets into their deliberations so on and so forth. Daniel Fox. Good evening, sir. Um, Daniel Fox, owner of Otsada, Lake Orion. Um, I'm gonna keep this um, a lot more brief than I intended to. Um, I'm mainly here in support of the DDA for they've, everything they've done for me as a business to help keep me afloat since I did open two months prior to COVID hitting. I really appreciate the help I've gotten from them. Um, helping me getting grants and, and all sorts of things. So I do have a question and maybe somebody can help answer to me. I, we do have a redevelopment liquor license and I believe there's five other businesses in town that have the same. Then by definition, the reason we have these licenses is because there's a DDA in effect. So what we're worried about is that we will lose the ability to renew our liquor license and maintain future liquor license if the DDA is resolved. So 
I don't know if anyone here can help give me an answer. I have um, a call out to my attorney and I've yet to receive an answer on that. So, but that, that's something that maybe people haven't thought of is how it's gonna affect the restaurants in town. Well, we'll, we'll look at that uh, uh, debate possibility, but um, I would say cross that bridge if we come to it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, Rosemary Ford. Do you have comments you'd like to make about this? Ms. Rosemary Ford, comments um, regarding the DDA proposal, DDA vote, petition? Rosemary Ford, 225 North Broadway. Um, I've been hearing a lot go back and forth. I too am concerned because I don't want to see it dissolve because I see what it's brought to this community. And I think the benefits are tremendous. Um, as I said, I've lived here all my life and I'm 67 years old. I have lived here at a time when I would say probably from 1970 to 1990, you could shoot a cannon off down Main Street other than sagebrush, there was nothing else. Now it is vibrant and alive. And so I feel that it's important uh, that we keep this. Um, and uh, I really feel it's crucial that it stays. They do help, the DDA does have funds that come back to the village to help pay for it. Pay for services that they render, such as police, the DPW, and lighting. Um, I also look at that, from what I understand, with the DDA and us recapturing funds, we are able to keep these funds in our community as opposed to them going elsewhere, meaning that as opposed to when we pay our taxes, we have monies that go to Oakland County, we have Oakland County Community College, um, Orion Township. Money that comes from. Money that comes from, 12 yes. different other taxing. Correct. And if we dissolve this, um, I have to be honest, we've had, uh, my husband and I have had some people come to us in the past week, actually four different people that have brought this topic up to us and they say, well, you know, if it's eliminated, it will lower our taxes. It will not lower your taxes because these are recaptured funds that stay right here. The other thing they say is, oh, and if it's dissolved, then the village will get all that money. They will not get all that money. All that money is going to go back to the entities that we capture it from. We gain, I believe, and the DDA would know better than myself, but I think it's like an extra $500,000 that helps us to make this community go. So I just want to say that I am in support of it. I will be honest, initially I did sign that petition, but after everything that's going on and thinking about it, um, I uh, only wish that I could change that signature and I am unable to. So um, I know that I've spoken with some other people and they have felt the same way. So just thank you for listening to me, appreciate it. Thank you. Any other public comment? Mr. Ford, or uh, Mr. Kokanos. Am I interrupting something, Mr. Lamp? Gonna, I'll wait, gonna, I'll wait. I'm gonna time you. Okay. Don't time me because the other gentleman, the first gentleman up here had 15 minutes. You want to time me? We'll time each other later on. Board, Mr. President, Attorney, I want all of you to think about something. Who is going to do the job of the DDA? Are any of you going to step up and go to Mr. Fox or Elena Campbell and say, we want you in our village. We're going to help you. We're going to advertise for you. We're going to put you right in front. We're going to use your business at our events that we have. Is somebody going to take on music in the park? Gets three, four hundred people. Anybody have another idea to bring three or four hundred people? I put on a car show for Golling Buick GMC. We get the DDA support. It's one of the most loved events that we have here because the people come down from the village and everywhere else to see this. The DDA is a vital part of this community. Mr. Fox brought up one of my points. If the DDA wasn't here during COVID, we would have lost every restaurant and probably a few businesses because I didn't see anybody else on the board at that time stepping up and going to all the meetings at Oakland County 
to learn how to save the businesses. Mr. Fox, I'm going to ask you, did the DDA help you during the COVID? Elena? Okay. Who's going to do that? Mr. Lamb, you want some of the money. Okay. Let me make a suggestion. Have you ever talked to a state representative, a state senator, Congressman Sir. Peters, or excuse Sir. me, how about that? Okay. If you Getting might, money? I'm getting off the subject. I'm sorry. Well, no, that's right. If you might direct those comments to me. <laughs> okay, sorry. And uh, to the chair. And okay. let's not get this into a brouhaha. Well, I don't appreciate somebody trying to time me when it's your job to time me. Okay? So I think you better really consider this whole issue. And my last point is, if you have a mortgage payment and you're a day late because the mail didn't go through, you forgot to put a stamp on it. Okay, what's the mortgage company going to tell you? Sorry, Charlie, you missed the boat. You got to pay the late fee. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Ford. Stan Ford, 225 North Broadway. I guess my thing is I, I feel like it's premature in a sense because it isn't, there's a committee that's looking into the whole process. And I don't know, my only question is, I don't know where we are in that committee and what information they've come up with. And I'd like to um, have that information too. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Mr. Childers, sir. Jim Childers, 197 West Flint Street, part two. I also signed that petition because I always thought it's a good idea to have public input. It's the American way. We have the right to petition our government. After hearing other sides to the story, I would like to take my name off that petition as well. I support the DDA. I see what it has done for this community. This community is vital. There's a number of factors that come into play with that, but the DDA is one of the moving forces that make that happen. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay, close call to the public. Now, Council, uh, Mr. Spitz, sir, I'm going to give you, are you, come on, we're going to move this along. I didn't know we were in a hurry. <clears throat> I want to just say a couple things. Uh, 120 South Broadway, owner of that building and Bitter Toms, also an owner of uh, 146 South Broadway, 44 Flint Street, and a real estate developer who's developed 4 million square feet of real estate in his lifetime. I want to ask the, the council here, does 313 Pizza happen without the DDA? Does 120 Broadway Street happen without the DDA? Does the Eman Center, possible development of the Eman Center happen without the DDA? Doesn't. Well, what I want to ask you, and there is seven of you on the board, can one of seven of you tell me if you can name one city or community that's successful without a DDA. Can you? We're not gonna do that right now, sir. No, I, I, just, I, I just wondered, maybe the village attorney? Yeah. Let's talk about Traverse City, the vibrancy, the mini Chicago, Royal Oak, Rochester. I mean, you can't name one, can you? We talked about the deterioration of properties without the assistance of the DDA and the community. But developers like myself and Mr. Mosheri and, and the guys that are trying to redevelop the Eman Center, who one of the uh, you know, people here in the audience today said that Eman Center's been sitting there 35 years. I won made an offer on the Eman Center. I could not make that development work no matter what you gave me. What I'm trying to understand is that how can you consider, if you don't like the leadership of the DDA, then change it because you have the, the ability. If you don't like the direction of the DDA, then you have the ability to change the direction. What is our vision and what is our, what is our task? But right now, the DDA in this village, and that's why you brought in developers like myself, Mo Sherry, to this village, because it was always such a welcoming environment. And now what you're doing is you're taking away all of those assets. 
Um, and is it for money? Because I, I'm, I'm not certain that everybody understands the true dynamics of the financial system when it comes to taking away the, the DDA and where those monies get applied. Lastly, I want to talk about, you know, uh, one of the members on your board said something like, I wouldn't have approved 120 South Broadway when that was approved, the, the tax abatement. I would love, and I, I, I will put this on the record right now, I will turn in my tax returns for the last three years. I promise you, as a developer, I make zero money on that asset. It cost me 9.2 million, I borrowed 4.8 million at 3.65%. I have not taken a nickel in three years. And if you want them, I'll give you my tax returns. Take the depreciation out, just look at true dollars, it makes no money. Why did we invest in that, in this community? Because it, it was welcoming, we believed in it, and we believed in it long term. And so did the DDA. They believed in us and as a developer long term and creating what we would call, or I use, a culture sphere. And I think as a developer, I've done that in this community. One of the, the, the members of the community came out and spoke, and they said they could see whatever through the streets. Now on Thursday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday night, we have a vibrant community. If that's not what you want as a board, let us know. We'll go somewhere else. But please let us know and stop wasting our time. Okay. That's the last for the call of the public. No one else indicated they wanted to speak. Thank you. And we'll move on to council deliberation. So I think what the intent here is, Mr. Stevens, well, I know the intent here is asking this council to either take an affirmative action on the petition, uh, which would mean that the village would determine or just flat out say that we wish to retract the amendment of the DDA, I do believe is what the intention is here, and also, otherwise, or take the petition to a special election. Anything council wants to say at this point? Uh, uh, yeah. Mr. Hobbs. Yes. I wanted to be fair to both sides of this issue. We had the petition going around. I did sign it. It fell through, and so I'm waiting to see what the committee does. I don't hear anything from the committee yet, but I know they're working. So I'm giving the committee their, their chance now. So I like, will the committee come forth with a report, or, or how are we going to find out about what's going on? Thank you, sir. I, sure. can, I can give a quick update on the committee. We've met twice this next one. Um, we've asked the village attorney to come up with, to get us a, a number, a, a lot of different numbers and information from the county, from the state, as far as future projections, and then what are our options moving forward? Uh, because we want to know all of them. I mean, we all know there's, we can just keep things as they are, but what are the different legal options that are in front of us, knowing all the projected numbers that we can then make a recommendation? So. Future numbers, um, projections will be our next meeting coming up later this month, and then I'm assuming we can't get through all of it in an hour, so we'll have another um, meeting to talk about what our legal options are to be able to make the best recommendation. I would like to add a comment to that. I'm an alternate to that committee, and there's been one occasion already where someone could not attend, but that information that Ms. Rutz <coughs> discussing is to look at all of the options that both a DDA and a village can utilize to work for the best solution for the community. Mr. Narsh. Okay, so um, the committee. I want to make a couple of comments. Um, when this issue first began to be presented to the council, the first thing I wanted to do, I mean, in my entire career, it's been gather facts, investigate, get as much information as you can, 
be as transparent as possible and come up with a finding of fact. Uh, the trier of fact in this case, unfortunately tonight, has to be this committee on this issue. Mr. Stephen had asked for a considerable amount of time about this issue. And at one point in a conversation we were having back and forth, he had mentioned that he started this ballot initiative because he wasn't seeing any progress from the council on this issue. And what he didn't know is for the last two or three months we had been talking about that and I had been asking for this committee because I wanted to gather facts. I wanted to get each side of these bodies together. I wanted to be on that committee. Um, I consider myself a fact finder and, it, you know, I mean, if somebody can come forth and show where I've, uh, you know, not been honest with finding fact and truth over the last 40 years with you all, uh, I welcome that, but that's my desire and intent. And he said, I brought that forward because I didn't see anything happen. The committee is here and we're looking at all these issues. Now, I know this specific issue tonight is about the selection. And, and I gotta say, um, and, and no fault of Mr. Stephen, uh, he tried, but this thing was a down to the wire thing and here we are left with, as a council member, I've got lots of questions. We could just throw it out there and say, oh, okay, we've got all these petition signatures of which I've heard several tonight that said they wanna recant their signatures. But more importantly, we've got legal issues that have been presented from our attorneys that say there are certain things that we have to take into consideration. And when it's kind of important when you say you're going to throw an election, again, I want to make sure that we're doing everything legal because it's not like in the media you've heard anything about election fraud or something wrong with elections. And I certainly don't want to include Lake Orion in that. So I've got concerns. What's the freshness on these signatures? Uh, the issue of the referendum uh, has to be within 90 days of the enactment of the ordinance, which was back in 2020. Um, who would pay for and how long? All of these came to fruition because there were residents, and rightly so, who were raising questions and they weren't getting answers back. Now, the upside of that is there were members of our council and our DDA that were talking and putting together our board to look at some of these things and find some, some true facts. Um, but my concern of just throwing this out of this body saying, oh, okay, we're, we're gonna cancel our vote in 2020, um, and if somebody makes that motion, I guess we'll have to vote on that. But the other thing is there are so many legal issues with this election that I have, have like absolutely zero confidence, and I base part of that on Mr. Stevens' letter that he read tonight on the falling up the stairs to get where we are right now. I have zero confidence in moving forward to say I want to throw this at an election, which I have no idea legally if we can even do based on this issue without additional uh, input from our attorneys and perhaps the DDA attorney, um, you know, more minds the better. I mean, that's, that's my comment uh, this evening. It's about those, and I, and I don't, take that lightly. I, I respect people who come forward and say, I'd like to see this. I don't know how that was presented to them. Um, clearly, the Fords have had people come back and say, well, it was presented to me, or I left with the impression that if I sign this petition and we took this to a vote and it passed, I'll get more taxes back. I'm not saying that's what was presented, but I heard testimony this evening that said, that's how they interpreted this. So at this point, I have zero confidence in moving forward and saying, let's have an election when there's so many legal issues and other issues that are taking away and eroding my confidence that at this point in time, this is the right thing to do. Is that it? That's it. Anyone else? Mr. Lamb? Thank you so much for your opinions on the DDA, all of you. I'm a, I'm a the, uh, Mr. Stevens has put a lot of effort into this, and I, and I think the reason he came here tonight is because it's clear that our charter 
and our local board governs this question. Yeah, I've, th I've researched this so heavily. I think I've personally spent like, you know, thousands of dollars, you know, it's researching the law. It, it really, this whole question falls on Jerry, okay? And you and Doug and Brad and Teresa and Sarah to decide whether or not we're gonna follow our charter. The misconception that appears to be growing out here and continues to be promulgated by most everybody that speaks is that canceling the TIF doesn't kill, kill the DDA. It, can't, it cancels their main funding source. Last year they got $60,000 in donations. The DDA could get a 2% millage against their businesses and you could create a new TIF. Okay, when the DDA was started, it didn't have a TIF and it had no money and the village supported it. Um, who used to run the DDA before they hired a director? I think uh, the village manager used to run the DDA. Uh, in a small community like this, we discussed here at the board level that the planning commission could run the DDA under the state law. So what, what Harry's here tonight isn't to argue, you know, he's arguing about the legality of his petitions and what the village council's obligations are to it. So really, I just am gonna to speak to that. Uh, I believe after, you know, discussion with the attorney uh, that there is no law that tells us what to do uh, in this case. There's no protocol. Mr. Stevens has exhausted himself to try to find some protocol that dictates what council has to do. I've read every state law affected by this thoroughly myself, and there's still no, no protocol. So it's up to the council to decide what to do with the petition. That's all. So our charter says they go to the next election, and it says, or they can go to a special election. So Harry screwed up, or the petitions were screwed up, or the process was flawed, he didn't make the November election. But the petitions are still valid, and it's still up to the village council to decide whether to have an election or not. If we don't decide to have an election, I believe we're in violation of the law and the intentions of the law. Now, the council has not made an opinion on this. Okay, so it's the council's decision. So it's up to us to decide. Anyone so, else? Uh, no, sir, there's no more public comment at this point. <coughs> Sorry, apologies. Yes, Ms. Lushiku. So, Mr. Stevens, uh, I believe, was not given very good instructions or, you know, when you have a letter that as long as he wrote, explain or outlining all the missteps, um, it's clear that those processes need to be um, fixed. But uh, what we have left is a big legal mess. Um, so before voting on this, I, I do think we, we need more direction because uh, like, like somebody said, I mean, you know, election fraud and all that, that, that hasn't been an issue very much in recent years. So I don't want it to start at this, this level now. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, but um, I do want to apologize to Mr. Stevens. This, this was a big effort on your part, but I just, I, I don't know what to do with regards to moving forward with this, because um, there were so many missteps. Anyone else? So we have oh, Ms. Wright. I was just gonna say, um, I agree that this process is, I mean, it's multiple layers of opinions, direction, government, it's, that's hard when you don't know, which is why I also echo like, this is, this is also hard for us because while the guidance wasn't clear, we're still at this place of there were missed deadlines. And I appreciate all the effort that was put in, but just because all the effort was put in and they, it was hard doesn't necess necessitate us to give special consideration because different deadlines were missed because the process is hard. That's just rushing things. Um, and I don't think we do our best work when we're just rushing things. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm at as well. I'll make my comments real quick. Um, in the attorney's letter, I just wanted to mention this. Most notably is the question that if the section 
reference in the petition was repealed, then that arguably removes most funding sources from the DDA, and thus the DDA may cease to be able to function without any TIF capture funds. So it doesn't say that the petition doesn't state that the DDA would be terminated, but without possible funding, we are unsure how the DDA could continue to exist from a practical perspective. So I just want to mention that because I think that's an accurate statement. And I am not in favor of just saying that we are not going to fund the DDA or to defund the DDA. I will never be a, a, a supporter of that. There's been too much good. We could talk for a long time. But some of the things that I wanted to mention is just like, even like Fork and Pint, there was cases. Fork and Pint would not be here today. The DDA bought that building and then sold it and helped them and assisted them with coming in here. That question about who does the job of the DDA, that's a good one. I don't know who would, who can? And the petition language, many different things brought up. But one of the things I wanted to mention is on the county, state, and national level, Lake Orion is recognized as a community with forethought and resilience and growth and free thinkers. And that's part of and a result of the DDA. We're herald. That has no price tag on it that I can associate to it. That is marketing above and beyond anything we've ever achieved. We have people knock on our door and say, hey, we want to be part of that community. That's what the DDA has assisted us with. So I just want to make my personal statement about I will never be in favor of defunding the DDA. But we have no council question here tonight. We have no motion for any action. The one thing that I will suggest is although on multiple cases the petitions have been deemed as not being accurate and complete, I don't know about the ability to say, well, we would like to do a special uh, uh, ballot or a special um, vote on this in May or April. There's information we don't know, zero confidence at this point that we can move forward, much like Mr. Narsh had said. I share in that comment as well. And that's my comments. Yes, sir. Just one more. You know, the, the, the old joke is there's two things you should never watch being made. One is sausage. The other is legislation. <laughs> Hopefully at the end of it, the sausage tastes good and the legislation works well. Um, the, but um, the committee is formed. And, and I want to say this back honestly and openly to others. This committee is formed. There will be information coming back. Um, to the public, and again, it's to look at all of these concerns and all of these questions about infrastructure needs within the village and how the DDA can uh, assist, and they have been assisting and uh, have stepped that up. So that committee is ongoing, and uh, there will be information coming. Last one for me, um, a good friend and colleague <coughs> in the municipal government, Mr. Barnett, had made this statement, and it's true. There's no gain in subtraction. By removing, there's no gain. This community sets on the cusp of great growth and great things. It's really my job, their job, our job, to look at that opportunity, even with this lumber yard consideration. Let's move forward. Let's do the right things. Anything else from anybody? Is there any? Uh, Recommended motion. Um, nothing happens. Nothing happens. What are we doing? Sorry. So you want to? I'll just make the motion. I move that we have a special election in May for Mr. Stevens. That's what he came for here. So I'm gonna. I've supported Harry. He's a diligent worker and a good citizen. There's your motion, Harry. Motion fails for lack of support. 
and we will close this item at this time and move on to the selection of village manager item number four. Mr. O'Neill had mentioned that he would like to excuse himself as we debate the village manager, but Mr. O'Neill, you have a manager's report. Would you like me to fulfill reading well, you, that later? If, I was going to ask you if you would do that for I me. I will, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll just take two minutes as a mini recess, please. Two minutes. Thank you.
Okay, we're back online. I'm going to resume this uh, agenda here. Next item is selection of the village manager. I'll just give the audience a brief. We had five candidates. Everyone had to, the opportunity to see the interview here in public, and we interviewed the candidates and chose at that time to make a selection when we had a full council. At that time, we had five members, two were not present. They were able to watch the video, look at the criteria, look at the qualifications. We've all had uh, background paperwork as well, the application and the resumes that we reviewed. And at this time, it's the opportunity for this village council to make a selection of the village manager. And uh, so I'm going to kick this thing off here. I'm going to make a motion, then I'd like to make my comments as to why um, and see if we get support. So I would like to file a motion to appoint uh, Darwin McCleary as the new village manager and direct the village attorney to negotiate a contract for village council approval. Support. Comment, Mr. Marks. And the reason I did that, I've had the privilege, blessing, curse, opportunity to work with every village manager here and under them and directly with them uh, since 1982. And I got to know these managers extremely well. And one of the things I had mentioned a while back um, as it relates to village managers is that a village manager is a snapshot in time. So, and this is something that I've learned, excuse me, sir, sir. Excuse me. Sir, if you might uh, give us the moment, thank you. Thank you. What I learned is village managers are a snapshot in time. So there are times where you're going to have an extreme need for something and you hire a manager to fit that need at that time. The average village manager's lifespan in a community is about three to five years. And part of the reason for that that I've learned in working with managers is that that's that snapshot in time. And that manager met those expectations. The community's needs changed and we needed someone with that skill set to come in and assist us. Uh, the managers move on to other communities who their skill sets match that community and this train continues to move. One of the things that Mr. McCleary has that I worked with him and uh, learned this, observed this, was just about every acumen that we have right now uh, certainly everybody has pluses and minuses, but what Mr. McCleary does bring is probably some of the finest financial municipal budgeting uh, of anybody in the business in the state of Michigan. In addition, he's got just tons of experience, literally not just here, but in large communities in uh, major infrastructure planning, funding and development, as well as tax abatement issues, um, j just about everything that we're looking at and addressing is his strong suit. Um, I also know the facts of why he left, and quite honestly, uh, I, I, was, I think I was the first person he told um, when he was leaving, and, and I told him after what he told me was, dude, I would go too, <laughs> because of the opportunity that he had at that moment. Um, and it was just something that was, um, kind of off the charts uh, of a blessing for him. But that said, um, I believe that his acumen and his musical talent to interject <laughs> at the right time, he's not my baby, but um, I, I just that's my opinion, is he has that snapshot and time skill set that we desperately need to move forward over the next couple of years in this village. Ms. Wassinger. Um, so my experience with Darwin was when he was a consultant, I believe, for uh, Joe Young last year or the year before. My time frame has gotten a little warped. Um, I was underwhelmed. I, I wasn't really sure what he was doing, um, how he was helping. That was not communicated. Um, I, I think that uh, Mr. O'Neill has actually really hit the ground running 
And not only that, I've heard um, positive feedback from uh, folks that are at the village offices on a daily basis and have to interact with them on a daily basis. So I think now we need some new blood and uh, Mr. O'Neill has shown that he is willing to really get the job done and do it well and not uh, be disrespectful to his colleagues. Anyone else? Mr. Hobbs. Yeah, I was one of the people that picked the interim and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand behind him because I think he's just getting started in what he wants to help the village with. Uh, I, I echo Sarah with, you know, I heard, I've heard from uh, village staff and stuff like that. And they, they work well with them. And I think that's important because I, I don't deal with them every day, but they do. And uh, I, I think he's got some things up his sleeve that could help the village out. I'm, I'm willing to stay with them. So that's where I'm at. Anyone else? This is just a question if we're allowing public comment. Normally you do that before motion. Uh, yeah, actually I should do that now. I'm sorry, because I had somebody ask me that, and that was Mr. Reard. Are you still here? He wanted to make public comment about the manager. Is there anybody else? Close call to public. So we'll continue on. Uh, Mr. Rutt, did you have anything you wanted to add? You know, I went, you know what, I was one of those who was not at the, the in-person interviews because I had a pre-scheduled first weekend away without the kids since before the pandemic that we scheduled months ago, but had the chance to review the tapes. Um, and a lot of, I mean, some of you may have been here, great applicants. Um, some of them who I think did, had we not had, if, if we didn't have such complex issues, could have been great candidates. We just have some really complex issues here in the village that, we need people with experience um, for um, pros and cons to both of them. Um, my experience with Mr. McClary was when he was the previous village manager here was very limited. I was on the parks committee. Um, things that I, I can echo Mr. Narsh's comments that um, he was very good with budgeting. I can tell you that he came into the parks committee meetings and gave us much more information than we ever knew about, about what things cost, uh, not just in terms of, oh, we, we bought a, a, a swing. But then, okay, you bought a swing. This is how much it's also gonna cost for the DPW to install it. Here are the actual costs, total costs, that we had never been given before. So I was impressed with that. I know he did come out and plant arborvitaes with us once. Um, so my, but my interaction was limited as I was just on the parks committee during that time. Um, and yeah, so I appreciate that. I, I appreciate the, the thinking about what does this village need right now? And we have a lot of things that we need to pay for um, that have not been planned for. I mean, that the, I'm assuming, if I'm remembering dates correctly, Mr. McClary was here when that SAW grant was awarded, but then not when the recommendation from WRC came out for the lift stations. Um, but when we got that recommendation, was that now four years ago? There hasn't been a plan put forward. And so having someone who can create those plans um, with that strong financial background is really important. Um, and so I'm comfortable from that aspect of knowing that he's really strong with numbers. I, um, Mr. McClary was here previously and for, I think it was approximately three and a half years, four years, he, always uh, provided extreme accuracy, good financial planning, good budget data, um, was open to all of the questions and communication. Um, he loves this community. He is from this community, um, whether that makes a difference to anyone or not, but I think it's important and the only thing that I had with his tenure prior is his involvement, his civic involvement of getting out and meeting and greeting 
in the interviews, he indicated, he said that he plans on improving that. And with that, I think he'd be a stellar candidate. We need a rock right now. I see him as the opportunity to provide that strength and that rock that we need. We have a lot of issues. I asked him one time a while back about uh, how does he view our village and some of the difficulties we have. And he mentioned that it's no different than other communities. There's nothing really odd or difficult here. Everything can be managed well and um, no fear, essentially. So I like the fact that he was very strong in his statement that he has the background of this community, knows what's going on as far as trying to move forward financially and with just some of the issues we have that we need to do for infrastructure. He's aware of those. And I believe his exact words were, make no mistake about it, I can hit the ground running. And I think that's an accurate statement. So, anyone else? Can I make another comment? Yes. Yep. Uh, I just wanted to say, when, so I was on that committee that um, recommended Mr. O'Neill as well for the interim manager, and I do think he was the right choice right now for this village and that he was able to hit the ground running. Um, with his experience in the area. And I think either candidate, Mr. McClary or Mr. O'Neill, can do that because they both have experience now in this community. They both have experience in Southeast Michigan in general. Um, and I'm, at this point, as, I've, as I listened to both their interviews and I looked at their strengths, it really comes down to me some of that fiscal piece in that we need somebody who is very strong in helping us plan for the future. And as I listened to his interview and some of the planning pieces, as he, how he helped some of the other communities that he has served, that stood out to me. Mr. Lyon. Thank you. I, I sat through the interviews and I listened to all the candidates and um, I would say that Mr. McCleary and Mr. O'Neill are, are both qualified for the position. So I looked at, you know, the, what are the needs of the village? All right, I noticed that in three committees, uh, Mr. O'Neill, in three communities, Mr. O'Neill uh, provided five-year plans for economic redevelopment. And I think in one case, he was appointed uh, by the state to one of the, to one of the communities to develop a, who was bankrupt to develop a five-year plan. So I think, I think he has a strong financial background. And, and I have noticed that uh, even though he's interim manager, he's got a lot of stuff done around here and just punched it out the door unlike any other person I've ever seen in this village. Okay, I had to live through Joanne. That was an experience. I was a resident at that time. And um, Mr. McCleary was in that, you know, vague uh, era of the village. Um, but what I noticed about Mr. McCleary, and I, and I don't want to detract from a very skilled and talented gentleman, but he quit us for more money and just ditched us and went to another community and then they had a falling out and he opened his own business. He got a job in a small town making a good salary. And now he wants to come back here because he's so enamored with our community and he belongs here. So money isn't everything. A lot of it, ha I'm, I'm not done, Ken, but thank no, you. No, I know. I know. So I'm money is not everything and I, and I know you want to defend Darwin to, to no end. I well, I noted quite a few things about Mr. O'Neill recently. He's kind of a take charge leader kind of guy. And he seems to be leading, leading the village. He's leading the staff. Uh, he locked the village council out of the, out of the <coughs> chambers. Uh, he took our key cards away because he said we don't belong in the office. And I, I laughed. I laughed because you know, he explained why. He said it's a lot big liability having council people wander around in the government offices late at night and stuff. And, um, yeah, I just don't have confidence that Darwin won't leave us again. I have a lot of confidence that Mr. O'Neill will stay here, help us develop a plan, help us develop a budget, get our staff going. He mentioned he would train the, the new young treasurer. He would train all the staff. He would train these people to take over for him when he left, uh, which is one thing we've never had here in the village is continuity. The only continuity we've ever had in the village has been like some council members that have been here forever. 
and you might see what that's got. So, yeah, I, I, I think I would support uh, Wayne O'Neill. I think the committee did a fantastic job picking him. I agree with Teresa to a point. It would be nice to have one of the uh, less experienced candidates who could go maybe grow into the village and you know develop a relationship. But but face it, we're we've got a lot of work to do. We have a lot of money to spend. Um, we're going to have a lot of trouble finding the money to fix this stuff, and you guys all know it. And uh, I don't see a quitter, someone who who abandoned us, as as the going backwards. You know, the Japanese thing is. Let's all move forward together. And, um, you know, I think we should move forward and not go backward. Mr. Hobbs. Yeah, I agree with uh, Councilman Narsh that the life, lifespan of a manager is a few years. But I know Mr. Cl McClary just took this job in another community in, in April, and now he's quitting come to, uh, to our, back to our community. So I, I, that get, gives me a, a st Do you know why? Pardon? Do you know why? No, I don't. Uh, because they did not fulfill what was uh, stated as part of the contract. Basically, they're not funding his position. That's correct. And they they're hadn't funding. funded it and, from yeah, the beginning. And, so yeah. they're, and they you, told them How do you guys late. know all this stuff? I never know anything. Well, how do you guys uh, always know? Just do research, sir. Did you call Darwin up and, and ask him? No, sir. Okay. Because I don't know anything I, about that, and I didn't find I anything. I did Google, and yeah. there was a news article from Stockbridge saying, because, yeah. you know, I was curious, too, about that yeah. same yeah, question. I mean, I, I don't you know. know. I'm just and saying so I don't know. there was a news article I, I about Googled Stockbridge them all. That's similar, no, saying right. something similar that they weren't sure if they even mm -hmm. needed a manager. That's, that's the information I got. Right, that was what I read too as well. So yeah. after he was in the position mm -hmm. for how long they decided he, they didn't need a village manager well, anymore? They didn't decide <laughs> they didn't need one, but the news article said they hired him but still weren't sure that they needed one, right. was the news article I read. Right. Right. So and I'm not so sure in the past that he left us over just money. I cannot verify that. So I think that's an erroneous statement. And then also um, the council chambers were locked because we had accusations of visits out of possibly in the nighttime of council members and we had to lock it down. So that was not some great reason because that's appropriate. It's just that this was out of hand. Mr. Narsh. Uh, no, I was just. Okay. So anyways, we have a question on the floor. Motion's been made uh, to hire, negotiate, have the attorney negotiate to hire Mr. McClary. And we have the support. And I'll do roll call. Luck Singer? No. Matheson? Yes. Narsh? Yes. Rutt? Yes. Van Porfley? Yes. Lamb? No. Hobbs? No. Motion carries 4-3. Thank you. So moving on to reopen the call to the public, non-agenda items. Um, if anybody would like to speak. Mr. Barnett, sir, good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for what you do for our community. Appreciate it very much. Um, I'm not trying to reiterate and rehash, and I purposely didn't come up during the public comment on the DDA issue because sometimes I think people think I have too loud of a voice in this situation, in this um, discussion. But I do think it's important, just a couple thoughts, and, and maybe this will be the last time we talk about it for a while. Um, but we have a great opportunity to really come together. We have elections happening in our village. Um, we're working with Oxford, it seems like, sometimes better than we work with our own people, <laughs> our own community. Um, you know, Mr. Lamb, you just said in your own comments um, you believe we should move forward together, and I think that's a, a really a good message for all of us. I agree with you. Um, there's been a lot of misinformation, and it, it has been misinformation. A lot of the people I've spoken with over the last few months, and frankly over the last year, and we heard some of them tonight, um, 
are, are being fed mis misinformation. And I think all that this, this discussion does, um, you almost had my, my quote, what I've been saying accurate was close enough though, but Sorry. we never get more from subtra subtraction. This entire conversation is about losing resources in our village. The real conversation and discussion should be with this committee about how do we find a way creatively and legally to fund the needs of the village without losing, depending on what year you look at, upwards of half a million dollars a year forever. And it needs to be stated very clearly, getting rid of the DDA will not decrease one resident or business's taxes one penny. And what you're finding is, and what I'm finding in talking with these business owners, is we're dividing the business owners from the council and the DDA. And this room was full a couple months ago. You had multiple business owners here tonight. Only a couple spoke. Um, if anyone should be for this dissolution, it should be the township, and we're not. You can talk to the other board members. I'm speaking just for myself tonight. But our fire millage would get a raise. Our parks fund would get a raise. My township general fund would get a raise. And I'm sitting here saying we don't want it because those resources are being spent properly and, and to really support our downtown. And I do think, uh, I'm not going to reiterate everything that was said, but um, I don't think it's a legal mess. It was said before. We've, we've, we've talked to our legal counsel. I, I don't disagree. What Mr. Stevens has gone through has been frustrating. Um, but, but actually, the law has been followed to a T. Um, so I think we need to stop the misinformation. Um, I would, and I know you already voted on this, but the special election is, is dangerous, it's costly, and it's going to divide our community. That's my thought. So thank you for, for what you do. Um, we're excited to be great partners and continue supporting our downtown, and I'm excited to see the work of this committee. I'm an alternate, um, but I'm not there. I'm there to learn, too. Um, I think Teresa's done a great job um, saying that over the last few meetings. I, even when I don't come to your meetings, I generally watch them, because um, I love the work you guys do. And I think we're on track to do great things. And, and I think that if we did dissolve this or, or look to take a step back, it would only hurt us. So thank you for all you do. Have a great night. Thank you. Anyone else? I have one letter I'd like to read into public comment. And it is from Lloyd and Kathy Cole uh, asked that I do this. Hello, my name is Lloyd Cole. My wife, Kathy, and I reside in the village of Lake Orient at 544 Barron. And we also own the building and business downtown at 2 South Broadway Street, also known as Ed's Broadway Gift and Costume. I've served as a board member on the Village Council, the Lake Orion Lions Club, and I'm an active board member in the DDA, chairperson of the Design Committee, and a, voice, and a vice commander of the Sons of the American Legion. Kathy has been a board member of the Parks and Rec Committee, an active board member of the Christmas Parade Committee, and a member of the Ladies Auxiliary. We are obviously very involved with community and will continue to do so. We would like all the council members to know that our downtown development authority has our overwhelming support and think they do a superb job to eliminate or defund or our DDA would be a grave mistake for our residents and businesses. We will and have make sure our, our associates and friends understand this. Please support our DDA. Our businesses have been here over 25 years and we have witnessed the downtown, downtown growth like no others. We have become a destination community to live in and operate a business. This is because of our DDA, our DDA board, and our unbelievable and fantastic volunteers. Thank you, Lloyd and Kathy Cole. Anyone else for open? Closed? Okay. Call the public. Council comments. Mr. Matheson. Nothing tonight. Thank you. Mr. Land. Um, I'd like to say I think that uh, Nick and you are jerks for a sandbag and Nancy. Um, I think it would have been appropriate for you to have caught her in the hall and uh, said that her, since she was uh, generous enough to give you a copy of her speech, which you had time to look at prior to the meeting, you had enough time to get organized to comment on its legality, it would have been appropriate to catch her in the hall and say, hey, maybe you shouldn't say this stuff because it's inappropriate. She worked hard on that stuff and yes, she is my wife and she's entitled to run for village council. The U.S. Constitution gives women rights to do those kinds of things. So I, I just want to say I don't appreciate the comments as, as her husband and as a council member. I don't think we should ever sandbag anybody, DDA people, anybody. So that's my comment for tonight. Thank you. Mr. Hobbs? 
Say la vie like goes on. That's all I have. Okay, nothing tonight. Thank you. Mr. Nars. Hey, sausage was made. Not everybody's going to like the sausage, but you know what? It's Lake Orion, right? I mean, look at what we've gone through in the last couple hundred years from Canadagua, if I said it right, to where we are today, to swindlers selling swamp land, to uh, trying to buy a house in the village. If you don't spend 30000 over asking, you're not going to get it, and in 15 minutes it's gone. There's a reason for that. I've always said it's a three-legged chair. It's our lake. It's our historic residential community, and it's our bang and boom and business district. And everybody in this room, and everybody that exercised in this debate tonight has a part in that. But when you have a three-legged, and make no mistake, you think Oxford wouldn't love to have um, a Birmingham-style downtown like we have in that we're off M24? You don't see gravel trains coming past the sagebrush and past uh, Bitter Tops. So it, it's even got a creek in the middle of it. And I want to see us light that up at night so when you're walking downtown, you can see the water coming down the dam. It's kind of cool and make that, a, you know, it's something we're going to be talking about in the future. But Lake Orion is unique. It's cool. We're going to make it through. We got some challenges. Um, but we've got a really cool team and we got people up here that make no money doing this. Um, that we're just here because we love this town and we want to work together. And, uh, and make it the greatest possible place it could be. Challenges are out there, but you know what? We're going to get through it. We always do, and we will on this as well. Thank you, sir. That's right. Just a clarifying comment. We do make $10 a meeting in full disclosure, and council members have the option to turn it back to the village or not, and I'll be full disclosure. I take that money, and I do something fun for my kids because I miss a lot of hours with my kids being up here. So. Just wanted to clarify that it's well, basically no money, capped at $360 a year. In case you're wondering if we have extra meetings, we are capped. I've, and I've never seen a check because I give mine to the uh, Kids and Cops program. So, I mean, it was, uh, I, I've just looked at this as a volunteer and I, and I really honestly, the heart of everybody here is, everybody here is a, a volunteer, so there. Okay, for me, I just want to mention Lake Level tonight. Lake level was seven inches last Thursday with the intention of an inch and a half drop per day each day after that, which makes it roughly about 12 inches right now. And the DPW is monitoring and watching that flow and the intentions are to be down a total of 28 inches by October 17th. And I see the director nodding his head in accuracy of my statement. So that is a continuation. Um, and be careful, everybody out there. It's down already. If you haven't moved, you got to pay attention. Um, the last thing I have is, again, I, I, I'm going to apologize, but I need to do this. There's no sandbagging. It was 4 o'clock this afternoon, and there was there was no intention of sandbagging somebody. It was reported that um, Nancy Mosier was not going to be here tonight. Sorry. Anyways, that's not the intention. And I apologize to you, uh, Mr. Grakowski, because I know that that's not. We did not sandbag. So that's it for me tonight. And then uh, I do have the manager's report to read Greens Park cameras and lights installation will be delayed until next spring. We're looking at alternative ways for this project. The electrical for the bubblers will be completed soon. Village Hall painting is complete. Looks good. We are currently bidding Meeks Park Bridge installation, preparing for specs for North Shore drainage and the dwarf plans for shovel ready projects, which are awarded <coughs> funds. Lake drawdown. We are complying with the permit. The drawdown is on schedule. We received an email from Eagle indicating that there may be a problem with the drawdown rate and or the date we started the drawdown. Our permit says that we are to start on or after September 19th. And we started September 27th. We are drawing down two inches per day and are at 13 inches. We will be at 28 inches by next Monday the 17th. We can be at this level no later than October 31 and a lake level increase to the winter level by November 8th. Two of the three most sherry projects have been approved by the Planning Commission, the PUD for Starboard, and the Site Planner in the Pipeline. 
Art Watson and several residents from Lake Street met with West and I Monday to discuss helping with the removal of knotweed and cleaning up of the access area at the end of Clare Street. These are volunteers and they have the right to do it if they would like to clean and maintain the area. West indicated that we can supervise these volunteers and have a professional do the herbicide. We received a call from and a visit by two residents from the end of the street and they want to be notified when any activity will take place in the area. The village applied for a grant from Oakland County this year for removal of knotweed for several areas and were not awarded a grant. And dangers of Japanese knotweed, which is at the end of Clare Street, which we're just kind of discussing about having residents remove it. The World Conservation Union lists knotweed as one of the world's worst invasive species. Knotweed forms dense thickets where no other plants can grow, which changes the soil chemistry. Its strong roots can grow through concrete pavement and foundations, destroying buildings, roads, and other structures. Because knotweed harms property values and is difficult to control, it is important to take quick action to control young, small infestations. infestations. Cutting and applying glyphosate herbicide inside the hollow knotweed stems can control small infestations. Cutting alone does not control knotweed. It may make it worse. Herbicide must be applied after cutting to reach the roots directly and kill the plant. Every stem, stem must be treated to kill the plant. Cut the green knotweed stalks one joint above the ground and use a thick or stick or screwdriver to puncture any membrane inside the hollow stem. Put herbicide on the cut surface and inside the hollow stem. Any long shoots that re-sprout the following spring can be treated the same way. All cut materials should be bagged and set to a landfill, not composted, because dumb pieces can regrow. And it's actually a very uh, invasive species. I had recommended that it be handled by a licensed contractor, not a neighborhood group. But we'll see where that goes. I do have one other thing I forgot. This is for the community. This is the Review Magazine. It features other communities. This is from October 2022. And I just want to mention, I know people have said that uh, the council says, or the village manager has said, that one of the ways we're going to get some of these uh, infrastructure improvements done is by grants. And that's all they keep saying. But this is important. This is Water Infrastructure, American Rescue Plan, and Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Funds that go through the state revolving fund. These funds have the potential to help communities make a significant step forward toward more sustainable, safe, and efficient water systems. It's being allocated to the state revolving fund, the SRF. And they're looking for, or I mentioned that governments need to apply to, to be considered for ARP and bill funds within the SRF process. For communities that are not currently in the fiscal year 2023 application cycle and intend to apply must be submitted by November 1st of this year to be considered for 2024. At the very least, submitting an intent to apply opens the door towards eligibility for these federal infrastructure dollars and allows a community to have a choice to move forward with a full application. There's a lot of money out there. If you haven't heard that, there's a lot of money out there that they're distributing and it gives us the way to apply again forwarding this to our staff and we look forward to continuing to find ways to help our community succeed with all that we've got going on that's it for me tonight entertain a motion to adjourn so move support all those in favor please indicate aye aye, aye. aye. means adjourned thank you very much Ten minutes.